Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's fourth meeting of 2018. Agenda item one is a decision on taking item six, which is a discussion on the committee's work prog programme in private. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Agenda item two is the roundtable evidence session on Brexit and family law. The purpose of the roundtable is to explore issues around family law in the context of the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union. I welcome all the, the witnesses to the committee round in evidence session today and we'll start by doing introductions round the table. If I can start, Margaret Mitchell, I'm the convener of the Justice Committee. I'm Gail Scott, I'm one of the clerks to the Justice Committee. Gillian Baxter, and I'm also a clerk. Fulton McGregor, MSP for Court Bridge and Crayson. Janice Scott, QC, um, I'm an advocate. I practice in family law, including international issues. Ben McPherson, MSP for Edinburgh Northern and Leith. Lucia Clark, partner at Morton Fraser, um, specialising in family law. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Um, Juliet Harris, director from Together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Liam McArthur, the MSP for Orkney. I'm Liam Kerr, MSP for the North East Region. I'm Maurice Corrie, West Scotland Region. Uh, Paul Beaumont, uh, Professor of EU and Private International Law at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, Maddie Goujon, I'm an MSP for Angus Northern Mearns. George Adam, I'm Paisley's MSP. Janine Carruthers, Professor of Private Law, University of Glasgow. I'm Daniel Johnston, I'm the MSP for Edinburgh Southern. Rona Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Beardstein and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Yeah. Part of having the round table is a no, more informal setting. The evidence is obviously still recorded and, and, and out there in the public domain, but it's to allow a more free exchange between witnesses and, and members. Um, having said that, if you always come through the chair, then we can keep control of it. And don't worry about um, your microphone or having to press anything. When it's your turn to speak, again, as if by magic, it will automatically come on and you'll be able to speak into the microphone. Can I just thank all the witnesses who have provided written evidence? There's obviously a lot of work going into these submissions. Um, and there is the potential for today's uh, session to be very, temp uh, very complicated, very technical, and not really achieving too much. So I think really the, the essence of what we, we want to get through is um, a round table which the man in the street could look at and understand the extent of the problems, um, the options available, and um, where, where we go from there, more or less. So with that in mind, I thought maybe I'd start trying to look at the extent of the problem uh, with uh, family law and the various aspects and perhaps ask uh, Lu Lucia if uh, you would kick off as you do a, a very uh, good bit in your submission just I think putting that in context. Yeah so I started just with the figures yeah. um, which come from various other papers that have, have looked at this in terms of the number of international cases um, so 1,400, um, one, sorry, 140,000 international divorces, 1,800 cases of child abduction, and that's within the European Union each year. Um, I don't have specific figures for the UK or indeed Scotland, um, but I think we're all aware that families move about, people move about, and this is an issue likely to increase rather than decrease in terms of families with different people, different assets across borders. Okay, and the areas that we're, we're looking at, um, would somebody kind of like to, to pick that up and the potential impact, um, the size of the, the problem really that we're looking at to, to continue it with that? Who'd like to kick off with that? Professor Gather. I'm happy to begin uh, picking up the point that you made about this potentially being a very technical area of law. That is true, uh, but I think at the... Brexit negotiations, uh, the, 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 the referendum, people did not identify this as a pos possible area of controversy because it has been dressed up as technical mm -hmm. uh, and procedural, but in fact, when one pairs it back, uh, as Lucia Clark has pointed out, um, for people who live in families uh, in this session, and businesses and consumers in the next session, employers, employees, there are very uh, significant practical implications of this, uh, looking at three particular areas of international private law, which is basically the, the area of law that, that we're concerned with here. 
questions of jurisdiction which arise, which court uh, is competent to hear a particular dispute involving a cross-border family, questions of applicable law, namely the court exercising jurisdiction, what law will it apply, the law of which country will it apply to determine the, the uh, dispute arising, and then the question of the recognition and enforcement of overseas judgments. To what um, extent will a Scottish court recognise judgments from overseas and vice versa? And the rules of international private law, private international law, um, those are the rules which dictate um, how those three problems of jurisdiction, applicable law, and recognition and enforcement of judgments should be determined. The position will be that uh, on the advent of Brexit, the European Communities Act 1972 will be repealed, and with that, the uh, private international law landscape will change dramatically because the private international law landscape currently in Scots law is European in character. Uh, and there are various regulations, European regulations currently applicable, uh, and it is the, the operation of those instruments that will be in question uh, upon the advent of Brexit. That, that's, that's helpful. Can we look at the, the kind of issues that we're talking? We're talking about family law. Janet. Last year, I was asked to litigate a case for a wife who was in Scotland and a husband who was living in France. And there was concern about what law would apply. Now, the EU instruments don't govern for us what law, applicable law. They govern the court. And can I ask what the case was about? Was it divorce? Was it, it was a divorce, divorce? case, yeah. yes. And so we were concerned about the money aspects mm -hmm. of the divorce case. And we started proceedings in Scotland deliberately in order to secure priority for the wife's divorce and the Scottish rules for financial provision. Now, under the current EU um, provisions, the, the court that starts first carries the case, and no other court within the EU can then intervene. Following the withdrawal bill, if I had the same case and I started in Scotland, I could not guarantee that the French court would not start because they would not recognise um, the fact that the Scottish court had started first. Mm -hmm. The problem that we will face with the withdrawal bill is that if we implement it as it is currently drafted, um, we are saying we will carry on with EU rules and we will recognise a, a court that starts first, but no other court in, the UK, in, the, in Europe will recognise if we start first. Okay. Oh, and so we have a problem with that sort of case. And what we could get uh, in that sort of um, issue are two courts very expensively both conducting the litigation and potentially coming to conflicting decisions. And that's something which I would have thought that this committee would be very concerned to prevent. Uh -huh. We've already heard that um, it's private international law that dictates this. So I suppose uh, m one of my questions would be, is there an international recognised agreement or are there specific EU agreements too? Oh, I suppose, yeah. In that particular scenario, it's the EU and there's not an international agreement on right. priority of court uh, in relation to divorce. Okay. Some other comments? Liam, um, supplementary, and then Professor Bookwoman. Just reading the papers, uh, it certainly seemed as though I, I, I could see a, a community uh, emerging, but uh, I, 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 it sounded as though Professor Beaumont had a slightly different interpretation of what might happen, and I just wondered if Professor Beaumont might come in on that. That's okay. Sorry. I was <laughs> it took five minutes instead of hearing directly from Professor Beaumont, but thank you for that. Well, that was very kind of you indeed. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yes, well, I mean, Janice, Janice makes the point in relation to divorce, which is one of the few areas where there isn't an international regime, and she's quite right. So she selected one where there is a problem, but in most areas, my evidence suggests there isn't really a problem. People are worrying. Uh, I would say, it's, it, to quote Shakespeare, much ado about nothing in most cases, but we can have a debate about that. Uh, but in divorce, Janice is quite right, but I have to put the, the opposite point of view, which is that, indeed, we have a problem with the current regime, which most people acknowledge, which is that because it's a first-come, first-served regime, and there's a European Court of Justice case law on this, 
we, we see a pattern where uh, couples who have been in England or Scotland during their married life, but one of them is from France or Italy, usually the husband, the husband will try and instigate proceedings first in France or Italy in order to reduce the amount of money he has to pay to his wife, and we have to recognise that if he gets in first. So it's a swings and roundabouts arrangement, first come, first served. It can suit the, the wife if she gets in first. It can hammer her if she doesn't. Now, the fallback position is the common law in, in this context, not an international regime, if we, if we stop, stop applying the EU instruments uh, unilaterally. And of course, our fallback in this area is, is Scotland's proudest development in this whole area of law, which is forum non-convenience. We are the architect of a concept which has now been accepted throughout the common law world, the United States and all of the Commonwealth countries, and it comes from Scotland. And it's one of the few things we can actually say is a product of, of Scottish legal uh, endeavour. So I don't think it's quite shocking to apply a system of forum non-convenience, which would be our courts making the assessment as to whether there is a more appropriate forum to deal with it, and we decline jurisdiction in favour of the more appropriate forum. The sad thing is that uh, continental European countries don't apply that concept, and they will apply um, normally, under their common law, a lease pendants rule. So in fact, if we were seized first, they would respect that. That's their normal approach, outside of the EU rules. So you can take your choice. I've never been a big fan of lease pendants. In fact, I, I don't like it at all. I think it's arbitrary, and it's all about who's best advised and who gets in first. I think a better justice system is where judges make discretionary decisions about wh whether the court is the, the most appropriate forum to deal with an international case. Any more of the, the, our invited guests? Otherwise, then I'll follow up with some points that the, the committee made. On the, the same point, Mary, was it? I, yeah, it was related to the, the previous points that have been raised. It was just about, um, I, Janice, the point that you raised about two courts essentially running in parallel over a divorce agreement. So it's really who would be um, in a post-Brexit situation uh, if both courts reach a decision, what, what overarching body would, could there be um, to deal with that? There isn't. And, <laughs> yeah, and also it's just about the enforceability of each of those arrangements if both courts came to uh, a, a decision in that regard. How is that going to be enforced in either, in either country? That's precisely the danger, and that's what the EU instruments were designed to deal with. And I understand why Paul has reservations about these pendants. We all do. Um, one cannot defend the EU regime as being perfect. One can say that it was a work in progress. But what I think what we would like to say, it was better than what we had before because it prevented um, parties having to litigate in two places at once because they both thought they had the right regime uh, and then you had a problem over enforceability. And given the increased movement of persons, international families, um, that is not something which uh, in a modern world one can really, I would suggest, tolerate. One actually has to have a regime, even if it isn't the regime that one would ideally want to advance. I understand Paul's reasons as to why for inconvenience is a very civilised concept. On the other hand, one has to have determination and finality and reduce expense and distress for families. Okay. Can I respond to that? Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, <coughs> yes, but the trouble is that it's not actually true that the lease pendant system works for divorce. Let's be candid. If you technically look at it, it doesn't because Brussels 2A only relates to the divorce action. It doesn't relate to the financial provisions. That's governed partly by the maintenance regulation and partly by instruments we're not party to, which are the matrimonial property enhanced cooperation regulations. Therefore, actually, a French proceeding could continue in opposition to the Scottish proceeding because half of it relates to matrimonial property and not to maintenance, and they are not bound by the regulation uh, to defer to the Scottish proceedings. They're only bound to defer on the question of divorce, not on the financial provisions. They would technically be bound to defer on the maintenance aspects, but that is a small part viewed from a French, French perspective, a small part of the overall package. So you don't get the solution that you think you get if the French court plays hardball, which it's perfectly capable of doing, and the Court of Justice wouldn't prevent it from doing so because it's not a least pendant situation. I accept there are, there are deficiencies. Janine, were you, were you going to respond to that? Yes, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I, I share 
Professor Beaumont's uh, pride as an academic in this wonderful export uh, of the, the principle of forum non conveniens, but in fact, for clients who have to pay for this dispute to be settled somewhere, uh, the forum non conveniens, which is a discretionary system, uh, is expensive and typically lengthy to litigate. Uh, and I think those uh, considerations have to uh, outbalance the pride in the academic export. Can I ask, are we talking here about the, the financial settlement, really? Uh, there's a divorce itself, and uh, it seemed to be separated from the financial settlement. Now, I recently attended a conference on arbitration, and Lord Glennie then suggested that arbitration could be looked at, recognised internationally, worldwide, um, so there would be no dispute about regulations to settle maybe matrimonial property or finance. Would the, ca the, the panel care to comment on, on, on that? The, the Brussels to Beast uh, regulation is restricted uh, to jurisdiction and the recognition and enforcement of judgments in uh, matrimonial matters, which is divorce, nullity, and uh, judicial separation, and matters of parental responsibility. As Professor Bowman has said, it doesn't extend to the financial implications. The separate regulation that we're um, focusing quite closely on is the maintenance regulation, and that, that is concerned with the financial aspects, um, either parent-child uh, maintenance or spousal maintenance. But the, the, the problem highlighted is that these proceedings are not necessarily streamlined in one set. So strictly Brussels to be is dealing with the, the recognition of the divorce, but not necessarily the financial implications of that. Okay. Professor Bowman? Yeah, arbitration is an interesting idea. Um, of course, the arbitration couldn't deal with the divorce itself no. because that was a status issue. But in principle, there is no reason why, if couples agree, they couldn't put the financial aspects of their divorce to arbitration. Um, I, I don't think it's a terribly common practice in, in, in international matters. And I'm certainly not aware of it being a common practice, but those in practice would might be able to... Uh, alert me to, to that. It tends to be more used in the, in the commercial context rather than in the family context. Okay. We're very keen to see developed in the family context and it's something we've been working on um, and so that was a, a, something for the future. Um, obviously we're going to have to take a slightly different view of it um, post-Brexit than we might have done otherwise. Okay. Yeah, Lucia. I was just going to make the same comment as Janice, that arbitration is interesting for practitioners and academics, but it's not something that's widely known or used. And obviously the couple would need to agree to that. It doesn't solve the problem here, which is a couple who are in dispute, not just about how, how they're going to divide their assets, because obviously if everything can be done by negotiation, you don't need to go near a court other than to finalise the divorce. It's a couple who are in dispute about where to divorce and where to sort out the finances. Okay, and George. Uh, just one of the points that uh, in your written evidence that uh, Janice uh, uh, Scott brought up was the fact that you said this is family law is the point where Brexit becomes personal. And I'm only talking from a, I'm trying to keep this really simple because basically I'm coming from a simple perspective uh, that as a constituency MSP, when I've had interactions with this type of issue, it's normally been one party and uh, someone to take flight to another country sometimes with their children, otherwise <coughs> not. But is there not a case that if we don't have anything there to actually, because nine times out of 10 in divorces, it's not going to be amicable. There's always going to be problems and uh, there's not a case of who's right and wrong, but is there not a case that we make the system even more complex? And to a stage at a time like a divorce, you have a situation where there may be a party on one side or the other that might, like your example, you say someone starts something in Scotland, someone starts in France, they might use that as a way to actually continue to make their case and therefore make it longer and uh, make the heartache in the family even worse. Right, um, and that's why uh, EU instruments that bring certainty are helpful to parties because you can at least say to them, um, this is the court that will determine your dispute. And um, with divorce bring, comes in the financial elements. 
Um, what we are proposing, what is proposed, is really to send us off into the wilderness of uncertainty in family proceedings when we were actually on a course that was bringing us towards greater certainty, albeit it wasn't perfect. It was, a, it was something we were definitely working on, and, and I was very enthusiastic, I have to confess, in working on making the EU instruments better, work better for families. I'm involved in the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe on their Family Law Committee, and we were very keen to do that. It, it, was, um, it was a cooperative, collaborative exercise where family lawyers were involved in trying to make it more straightforward for families. And I'm hugely disappointed, confessing personally, that we pulled the plug on it. Um, Julia, you haven't said anything yet, so can we have your contribution then? Um, yeah, I just I wanted to reflect on um, George's point. I don't come from a legal perspective. I'm coming from a children's rights perspective and really want to put across the experience of children and young people in these proceedings of family breakdown, which is obviously um, a really difficult and traumatic time for children and young people. And I think as um, constituency MSPs, there will be more of these cases being brought to you. And the uncertainty that Brexit is bringing for families with EU connections is absolutely massive. And I mean, we do see in research that's been done with children and young people, the implications on children and young people's mental health, even now, not knowing what's going to be happening next in terms of Brexit and in terms of their rights. Um, the research that we conducted um, last year actually identified that 10% of babies born in 2016 have a parent who's from the EU. And so it, we, we are talking about a lot of children and a lot of families who are going to be un affected by this um, uncertainty. And so that's over 5,000 babies born in 2016 who are affected by this. And reflecting on what Janet said about the developments at the EU, that's where our research really showed the added value um, that is coming from the direction of the European Union in terms of children and young people's rights. Um, and so the framework that we're talking about at the moment is actually stronger than the Hague framework that we would um, fall back on in terms of um, children and young people's rights. It's very clear about the need for children and young people to have the right to have their voice heard in court proceedings, for example. It emphasises their best interests. It talks about the time scale of these proceedings, which in terms of a child's life is so important and that these things need to be sorted out with certainty, quickly and effectively. And as Janice kind of touched on, there are developments that are going forward at the um, EU in terms of a recast of the Brussels regulation. Um, and this is really drawing from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which I know the Scottish Parliament have um, really displayed a strong commitment to across all parties. And they draw from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to make sure that the rights of the child are absolutely central to these judicial proceedings. And um, because as we're sitting here and kind of get buzzed and kind of brain fried with the number of regulations that are, that are kind of affecting children and young people, children and young people don't care about that. They care about the right to have their voice heard, the right to not have to speak out in front of their parents in terms of cases, <laughs> and the right to have privacy and for certainty. And that's the most important thing. And that's what we're all lacking, I think, at the moment. Professor Woman, you wanted to come? Yeah, well, a lot of points. I mean, I, I, I uh, advised the Commission on revising the Brussels 2A. I was on the expert group. And we did indeed look at rights of the child issues. And indeed, they are being reinforced in the current recast. The trouble is, there's a big difference between theory and reality. So we might think the EU is wonderful, but actually when you do some research and see what actually happens, as we did, uh, for, funded by the Nuffield Foundation, on the application of the right of the child to be heard, the evidence was appalling. Because actually, uh, in, in the cases we were looking at, which are child abduction cases, where you have, under EU law, an override system which allows the courts of the habitual residence of the child before the abduction, to override a decision by the courts of refuge not to return the child. That system requires the child to be heard before you can actually operate it. And yet, the evidence shows that in most member states of the EU, the children are not being heard and override orders are being issued in complete and utter uh, ignorance of their rights of a child. That's the real situation. So, I mean, there's a world of a difference between EU aspiration and reality on the ground in the member states. And we have to be much more savvy about that when you do real research, and that was real research, looking at what was actually happening in all the member states. 
The picture is one of aspiration often, but not reality. And whether we're in the EU or not, that will be the picture in most of these situations. Now, in the specific terms of children, when we're talking about children who've been abducted, I honestly believe that the Hague regime is a better regime than the EU regime because of what I've just told you. The EU regime creates false hope for parents, left behind parents, that they'll be able to get their child back using the override mechanism, when all the evidence shows the override mechanism simply does not work. These states will not actually apply it properly and they won't enforce it. And for all the talk of having powerful enforcement mechanisms in the EU, it doesn't happen. The Commission never brings enforcement actions against member states for non-compliance with this area of law. It has never happened and they have no intention of doing so. I have pushed them hard and said you should be using enforcement actions. They ignore me. They don't do it. That's a political decision on the part of the Commission. So this is not a priority area for EU law enforcement from a Commission perspective. So there's no guarantee that these children will get their EU law rights enforced because there's nobody ensuring those rights get enforced. That is, I'm afraid, the harsh realities that we live in. Better, in my view, to have the clarity of the Hague Convention system, which operates in 90-odd states, not just in 28 EU states, why have a separate regime in Europe unless it's an improvement on the international regime? And in child abduction, I am sure it is not an improvement. In relation to other areas of child law, the Hague regime is, in my view, as I've explained in my evidence, just as good, if not better, than the alternative. In terms of maintenance, the EU regime is actually based, because I negotiated both the EU maintenance regulation and the Hague Convention for the for the UK and Scottish governments, because I was a consultant to both in those pleasant days when both governments cooperated together. Um, we <coughs> ne negotiated uh, the maintenance convention so that you do have a good international regime for um, child support, which now the US has joined in, which I'm delighted to say, and um, the EU is a party to. And we have, therefore, a good international regime which works for getting child support. We don't need the EU maintenance regulation for that. It doesn't add any particular value. That's my honest assessment as someone who negotiated both. Um, in terms of spousal support, uh, we can be thankful that the EU has ensured that the maintenance convention, the Hague Maintenance Convention for the EU, applies to spousal support when it's independent of child support, even though that's not a, a fundamental requirement of the convention, but it's, but it's an option, and the EU has exercised the option. Therefore, if we were a third state applying the maintenance convention with the EU, they would recognize our spousal support, financial orders, in the European Union under the Maintenance Convention because they have an obligation to do so. That puts us in the same position effectively as we are under Brussels 2A. No different. The only slight difference, as Janice has already pointed out, is on conflicts of jurisdiction. It's the only area, and frankly, you can legitimately take a different view on whether a race to the core is better than a race to judgment. And it's always been a debate, and there is no absolute clarity that one is better than the other. I want to, to come back. Uh, Juliet. Um, yeah, just the, the first thing that I wanted to say in response to that um, was the fact that both the UK government and the House of Commons um, Justice Committee have recognised that um, the EU regulations that are in place are actually stronger. Um, they, they say they're more sophisticated and effective interaction based on mutual trust between the legal systems. Um, and so the fact that that has been brought up by the UK government, I can send um, the papers to the committee afterwards if it would be helpful, um, and the House of Commons, I think, reaffirms to me that there is real kind of strength for children and young people in terms of the gloss that the EU system adds. Um, I'd also say that um, the EU system is something that's constantly evolving. And so the Fundamental Rights Agency published a really interesting report back in um, spring of last year on children's views of the justice system and professionals' experiences of the justice system as well. And the learning from a lot of this research is going into the development of the recast of, um, of Brussels. And so 
Yes, things aren't perfect at the moment. There's a lot to be critical in terms of the EU process, but it is reviewing, it's revising, and it's learning, and this is going into the recast. And I think, really, Scotland would be missing out if we didn't look at what's happening in terms of the recast, the added value that it adds to our children and young people and their experience in very difficult situations, and incorporate that into our learning and thinking. In so what Professor Bowman said of the children not being here at Heard, despite their having that being... Um, Overruled, more or less. Yes, definitely. Um, and it does happen. We, we haven't got it right at all so far. Um, but in either scenario, whether we're talking about e EU or Hague, there are problems with children getting heard in courts. OK. And um, Professor Crothers, was it next? I'd rather hear from the, the panellists as much as can. I'll come back to the committee. In support of what Professor Bowman has said, it's absolutely true to say that with regard to parental responsibility matters and maintenance matters, there is, in the event of a cliff edge Brexit, there is an alternative international regime that <coughs> operates through the Hague Convention, if we're talking about the Hague Maintenance Convention, uh, if we're talking about the Hague 1980 Abduction Convention, the Hague 1996 uh, Child Protection Conventions, there are these alternative instruments which we could rely on. We could sit here and do a line-by-line, word-by-word comparison of the various instruments. And on some points, we might say, yes, Brussels is a better regime. On others, we might say the Hague is a better regime. There's no great purpose in doing that, I think, at this point, because it's, it's going to be a matter of judgment on, on fine points of interpretation. I think it's important to, to recognise that there is an alternative regime in these areas. They're not entirely, they're not comprehensive, however, and on the maintenance, um, the Hague regime is less good than the EU regime insofar as there, there are not direct rules of jurisdiction. And I think perhaps in the sense of allocation of jurisdiction, which court can exercise uh, competence over various matters, there are differences between the Hague and the European uh, systems. And possibly that is something that is of particular um, relevance, the fact that the Hague does not give us direct rules of jurisdiction is a, a more significant lack than certain other aspects. The other thing uh, that one has to bear in mind is that for those international instruments, these Hague conventions, that the UK is bound by only by dint of its membership of the European Union, steps would have to be taken and taken quickly to ensure the continuity of application of those international, those Hague instruments uh, in the immediate aftermath of Brexit, just to ensure that there's no hiatus in the uh, application of the Hague instruments. Okay, I'll bring in Rona next and then Daniel. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that we talk about how children will be affected in this, but I'd like to ask some questions about that a wee bit later. If I could come back to Janice's um, case where you know two cases are being heard in different courts i'm just wondering what the different options are you know to, to counteract that presumably the legal profession has been pondering this since june 2016 and i'm wondering you know you've highlighted that the, what may happen but has anything been you know formulated to try and say well how can we if, if you know if, if it's a cliff edge how do we make the best of this the view taken by a group of family law organisations, and they were English organisations, um, the FLBA, my colleagues in the English Bar, Resolution, uh, which are English solicitors, and the International Academy of Family Lawyers, was that um, we shouldn't be rushing to ditch the EU instruments when there may be a cliff edge or a withdrawal bill that um, gives us the worst of all possible worlds, that the solution that they proposed and uh, has been endorsed by the Bar in Scotland is to see whether we can continue the current position on a at least a transitional basis to give us a breathing space to make sure that these families know where they stand for a period of two or three years, that the fear is that we'll suddenly be left with a quandary, particularly with a withdrawal bill that doesn't recognise that these are reciprocal arrangements mm -hmm. and tries to implement unilaterally what we've been doing reciprocally. Mm -hmm. uh, so our proposal to you, if, if you would care to adopt it, is that we advance, that in family law at least, we have a longer breathing space with a transitional provision. How, how confident are you that that will be acceptable? You know to everyone involved? Well, that's more a political question than a legal mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. That's the solution proposed by the lawyers. The mm -hmm. other part of it, and, and again, this is the, uh, the, the big political issue, 
is in relation to the Court of Justice of the European Union. Mm -hmm. The Court of Justice is not involved in substantive family law as far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. It's simply concerned in assisting us with um, disputes that arise in relation to implementation on procedure mm -hmm. and enforcement. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's not particularly unacceptable in political terms. And part of what we've been proposing is the Court of Justice continues to do this for at least during a transitional period so that we make sure that we're in conformity with all the other um, jurisdictions implementing these regulations. So please, will you just give us a breather? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stephen, sorry, sorry just, just, just to get back to basics on that, in the case that you talked about, um, where one may be heard in France and one may be heard here, if there was a child involved and say the, the father had custody in France and the mother wanted custody, which court would, you know, where, where would that, that start? Who, who would then, you know, take the proceed the action? Well, there's a whole variety of answers to that. The basic provision under all international instruments is the place that the child is habitually resident is the most appropriate place. Mm -hmm. um, there is an issue about divorce proceedings, whether people agree to um, decisions about children being taken in the course of divorce proceedings. Mm -hmm. But I, I was more concerned in that particular case with the divorce and the financial remedies that follow. So custody is something outside that? I mean, it, just, can be, it can be, it can be, yes. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, I was going to bring in Lucia next and then Daniel. Yeah, I, I think one of the things to bear in mind here is there's lots of different areas and aspects to family law. So we have parental responsibility, what you've been talking about, um, the, the old word custody or, or where the child lives, child abduction, where a child is taken by one parent across a border, um, and, and divorce and the, the money aspects that go with it. Um, and what I tried to make clear in my written evidence is there's a range of answers here for those different areas. So in some, as um, Professor Bowman has pointed out, there are Hague Conventions which can kind of step in and, and take the place if the EU law falls entirely away. And yes, there's some differences between the Hague Conventions and the EU law, but they cover substantially th the same areas. And we could quibble among ourselves about which we like better, um, but child abduction and parental responsibility is, to an extent, covered by, by a different international treaty. Um, my main concern, and I, I deal mainly with divorce and financial matters, um, is how that's going to be impacted, because there isn't an international treaty that springs into place to deal with that. Um, and and the, the really difficult question is, what do you do? Because... I think there's a range of options. None of them are ideal. None of them are great. The, the current system we've got is not ideal. Um, I think possibly, I don't want to speak on anyone's behalf, but possibly we would all be, or most of us would be agreed here, that the route we're heading down now with the EU withdrawal bill is the worst of the possible options for dealing with a solution for, for divorce and financial matters. Because what that will achieve is to replicate the EU law into our national law. But the EU law only works because it's reciprocal. And what we'll be doing is making it entirely one-sided. So the Scottish court will need to pay attention to and defer to the, the, the other 27 courts, um, but they won't have to defer to or pay attention to us. And that's a problem. So uh, the EU withdrawal bill, you kind of look at it and on the face of it, there's a solution there. Oh, well, let's just replicate the law over, but it's not. Um, so it's then, okay, what else do we do? Do we keep things going transitionally for a period, as, as Janice has suggested? Do we keep things going permanently as resolution and some of our, our, my English colleagues have suggested, where we just replicate the EU law and keep it going on a, a reciprocal basis, which would involve negotiation to achieve that? Or do we just let it all fall away and fall back on the old Scots law of forum non conveniens um, and, and try and, and deal with things in that way? And that, I think, is, is where you can debate the pros and cons of that. And in part, it depends on what the political will is and what is politically achievable. So we can tell you what the legal pros and cons are, um, but we, we can't perhaps tell you as well what is politically achievable. I mean, again, purely from my point of view, um, when dealing with divorce and financial cases. Um, I love arguing forum non convenience. It's really interesting, but it's expensive and it can be quite time consuming 
and it's, it's discretionary. So you don't have a, a clear answer. I can't tell a client at the start of this, well, you know, we're going to be dealing with it in the court in Aberdeen, um, or rather than the court in Munich. I, I can't, you know, you, you can't then make that call. So people have to, to, to get to that to argue. And it comes that the, all, the balance in the legal system on a lot of issues is between clarity and fairness. So do you have a, a system that is very clear and that gets to a, a fixed outcome and you can predict what that outcome is going to be? Or do you have a system that's weighted more towards individual discretionary fairness on a case-by-case -case basis? And, and that's a, a difficult balance to achieve. So forum non-convenience is fairer, but less clear. I'll, I'll bring um, Professor Bowman in again. I've got Daniel, I've got Ben, and I've got Liam on my list, so don't worry, you're there, but you know, the witnesses are who we want to hear predominantly from. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I mean, Lucy is right in what she, what she has just uh, said. Uh, just to, to add a gloss from, from my experience as a negotiator, both for the UK and for the EU on different issues, and currently only negotiating for the EU, uh, in a commercial context. The, the, it seems to me unlikely that we'll get a bespoke deal simply on Brussels 2A in the future. Why would the EU agree to that? Why would the UK agree to it? The, the fundamental problem is that in the long run that would mean accepting the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice when we don't have a judge on that court. It doesn't seem to be a very rational solution. So we can argue about the transitional arrangement. It's obvious there's going to be a transitional period if, unless there's a no deal scenario. In that transitional period, Brussels 2A will, and the other regulations will continue to operate. <coughs> At some point, they have to stop operating, in my view, because I don't see any realistic, if we, if we don't stay in the European Union, that's a different proposition, but if Brexit is to continue, it makes no sense whatsoever to try to negotiate a, a bespoke bilateral deal between the UK and the EU on some aspects of family law. Um, the forum for that kind of agreement should be The Hague, and we should try and have an international agreement if we want one on divorce issues, and that issue should be revisited there. Um, the only reason for doing that would be if the UK wanted to remain uh, in the long run as a closely associated state with the EU in relation to the European Economic Area. That's a political decision. But even EEA states do not have bespoke deals on family law. Let's be blunt about that. Norway doesn't have it. Uh, Switzerland doesn't have it. <coughs> Iceland doesn't have it. It would be unique and highly unusual. And I don't think the EU would invest the time and energy in trying to negotiate it. So it's not realistic. I, I think it's not a, a huge problem, as I said earlier, to, in the sphere of divorce, revert to the common law, remembering that you would be in exactly the same position as you are currently in relation to being able to get your divorce judgment recognized and enforced elsewhere. That's my absolutely clear point in terms of the financial provisions, because the maintenance convention is exactly the same in terms of its scope as the maintenance regulation. We're not part of the matrimonial property regime. We've, we've no intention of becoming part. It's an enhanced cooperation regime. Therefore, whether we're in the EU or not in the EU, the capacity to get your divorce financial provisions recognized and enforced in other EU states will be exactly the same after Brexit as it is now. That is the reality. The only difference, and Janice has pointed it out, is there's a difference on conflicts of jurisdiction. And that's the only substantive difference, and yet, sadly, the UK committees didn't point that out. They didn't do a proper job. Their evidence wasn't very good. Nobody asked me, for example. And they didn't actually come to an objective analysis of the relative merits of the two systems they were driven by, in my humble opinion, politics. And that is not a good thing. On this point, we should be objective, not driven by our views pro or anti-European. For the record, I voted for Remain, and I am a committed European. But when I come to look at this, I wear an objective, analytical hat. I do not let my politics drive my analysis. One small point to reply. If one's looking at maintenance, one has a question about what is maintenance. And we have a very helpful decision of the European Court of Justice which says that maintenance is anything that is awarded having regard to needs and resources for somebody's support. So it's not just how much you get a month. It can be a lump sum or it can be provision of a house. Now that is a very helpful decision 
of the Court of Justice. There is nothing similar in relation to Hague. There is no um, court which can determine between nations um, what a particular concept means for the purpose of Hague. And that's where the EU regime wins out um, over the Hague regime because th there is nothing supranationally to resort to. So I don't know in relation to Hague exactly what will be packed into the concept of maintenance. I know what's packed in for the moment in terms of the European regulations and I know that I can go to the Court of Justice if I want further clarification of that in Scots terms. But there's a problem there and that's why I do lack some confidence in the solutions that are being put forward. Thank you. Daniel. Thank you. Um, my question really sort of follows directly on from, from this exchange. I mean, people uh, getting divorced from other people living outside the EU is not something that's suddenly going to start happening uh, if, and I say if because I'm optimistic, uh, we don't leave the EU. So what, what, what currently happens and what, and what are the practicalities of that for, for Scots divorcing people from other parts of the world? I mean, what are the, what are the issues that they face? And also, could I just ask um, uh, 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 the people here, I mean, you, Hague has been referred to quite a bit, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who, who's probably not as up to speed as that as they'd like to be. So if somebody would be able to explain, that would be quite useful as well. On Daniel's question there, because that was a supplementary I was going to ask earlier on, because I think there's a lot of terms that are bandied about, and just to have a, a, the, the Hague laid out Brussels to the maintenance regulations, so the specific regulations we're dealing with, and in as plain English as possible. So I think that is one of the problems that we talked about earlier on, is how people pick this up. I think it is so vitally important yeah. to look at it, and I think that's part of the reason it's lost, is because we start bandying about these terms without having it laid out as clearly as possible. Mm. What they all yeah, mean. I, I called that one then. Phone, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh-huh. Liam, if it's connected, yes, let's have it all at once. Um, uh, yeah, the question I was going to ask was in relation to the convention. I think we've had a description of a, a dynamic process in relation to the, um, uh, the EU and um, Brussels regulations. It would be helpful in an explanation of, of Hague to have a description of how dynamic that process is. And that I think the conventions refer to date from the 80s and, and, and 70s, but I, I'm presuming uh, there's a process whereby uh, updates where, where it felt to be necessary can be, can be agreed and, and, and taken on board. Okay. Uh, who'd like to... Professor Bowman. I've, I've been to going to The Hague for 20-odd years and going to Brussels for 20-odd years, so I can try and answer from quite a lot of experience of working in both organisations. Now, The Hague Conference is The Hague Conference on Private International Law. It is the international organisation that deals with private international law, so it's the Private International Laws United Nations. It encompasses the whole world. At the moment, not all states in the world are party to the Hague Conference, but about 80 states are, and some of the most successful conventions have even more parties than that, so the Child Abduction Convention has over 90 contracting states in the world. Um, that does date from 1980. That deals with cases where parents are abducting a child from one state to another, one contracting state to another, and it's a, it's a system that in principle requires the child to be returned to the country from which he or she has been abducted. And it works very well. There's a very, very sophisticated set of um, case law which has been developed by no unified court, but by the senior courts throughout the world. So we have very clear jurisprudence from the UK Supreme Court, from um, the US Supreme Court, from the Canadian Supreme Court, from the Australian High Court, from the French Cour de Cassation, from the, uh, you know, the highest courts in all the major countries in the world. And you develop uniform jurisprudence in interpreting international treaties through careful interaction between these highest courts. Sadly, in a European context, the Court of Justice, when, even when it's interpreting international conventions, doesn't look at the jurisprudence from other countries, it takes a unilateralist position, a Europeanist position, it is not notably internationalist, sadly, and I say that with a heavy heart, but it's the truth. And we have to speak the truth to power sometimes, and that's the problem with the European Union. The Court of Justice views everything from the perspective of European integration. It's politically driven. It's driven by a, an agenda of a federal Europe, whether you believe in that or not. But that's, that is their raison d'etre. So therefore, even when they're interpreting international treaties, <coughs> they're not looking for a uniform Europe international interpretation, looking for the interpretation that best suits European integration. 
and that is a ter bit of a conflict of interest in, in our area. So, child abduction is dealt with by the 1980 Convention. Parental responsibility and access is dealt with by the Hague 1996 Convention, which is growing in its um, adhesion, but there's a long way to go. But there are over 40 states, including all the states of the European Union. That convention um, is very like Brussels 2A. In fact, Brussels 2A is modelled on it because it came, Brussels 2A came after the 96 Convention. And it, it get, gives a perfectly workable regime for recognising and enforcing orders in relation to parental responsibility and, and access in the 40-odd countries that are party to it, which post-Brexit, if we didn't have a bespoke arrangement, all the EU states would apply Hague 96 with us, and they'd apply Hague 1980 with us. It's part of the EU acquis. They're not going to abandon that. So that will be in place. So there is no cliff edge. Then you move on to maintenance, and that's a more modern regime. It's the 2007 Hague Maintenance Convention. As I say, I negotiated it. Um, we then built the EU maintenance regulation on the back of that, 2009. But it basically follows the convention with, uh, Janet's right, with uh, additional direct jurisdiction rules. But I don't actually see a huge value, <laughs> be blunt about it, in direct jurisdiction rules because we can have our own direct jurisdiction rules. The EU direct jurisdiction rules are not going to change. We know what rules they operate. We can either operate exactly the same rules or we can operate similar rules. There's no big problem of certainty there because from the point of view of clients, they'll know exactly what the rules are in Europe because it's what's in the EU regulation. You can make your choice. You know, that's not a big problem whether we're in or out. It makes no difference. So those are the three family law areas all covered by the maintenance convention is growing in its, its popularity. As I say, recently the US has ratified it. Brazil has ratified it. There are, there are a number of countries that are coming on board globally. All the EU countries are party to it because it's part of the EU acquis and they'll stay party to it post-Brexit. Janet's right. We have to become an independent contracting state to the maintenance convention because at the moment we are party because we're a member of the EU. I know the UK government is committed to doing that. There's a technical problem about a possible transitional uh, issue, but hopefully given that we've got a transitional arrangement, we will be able to make that work and I think that should, 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 should be okay. So in the family area, in relation to child law, we have three international regimes which apply anyway for the UK with many international parties. We have a separate, different regime that we have to operate with the EU. If we leave the EU and don't continue with these arrangements, we will just operate the international regime with the rest of Europe. It'll be easier for students. It'll be easier for practitioners. It'll be easier for most people to deal with. If you have to ask very hard questions about whether there is sufficient added value in the EU system to create the justification for having a totally separate regime, which by de definition then has boundary issues as to when regimes apply. In relation to divorce, it's the one area where we don't have a successful international regime. There is a hate convention on divorce and a number of EU member states, including the UK, are party to it. But it only covers, of course, the question of recognising the divorce itself, which is not generally a controversial issue, even if we don't have any kind of treaty regime because states have their own unilateral rules on recognition and enforcement and it's highly unlikely that you're going to find that any divorce decree granted in Scotland or indeed in the rest of the UK will not be recognised in another European country post-Brexit in the absence of any treaty framework. So we're really talking about money. And as I said earlier, when we're talking about money, because custody is dealt with under the 96 Convention, when we're talking about money, Spousal support, which is the bit that's covered by EU law, is also covered by the Maintenance Convention. That's a fact. The division line between matrimonial property and maintenance, which the Court of Justice has outlined in a number of cases, Van der Bugard and others, will be the starting point of the dividing line for The Hague as well, because those who negotiated The Hague understood what the current concepts were on the division between maintenance and matrimonial property. It's in the explanatory report. I don't see any difficulty in thinking that, broadly speaking, the Court of Justice uh, broad view of maintenance will be maintained. What I do worry about, frankly, in the future, 
with the adoption of the enhanced cooperation matrimonial property regulations for many member states, but not for the UK, is that there may be a slight diminution from an EU perspective of the definition of maintenance because they may put more back into the matrimonial property side. And even within the EU, that would be a bad problem for us because we're not in the matrimonial property regulation. So, <laughs> I'm sure others will want to pick up on it. Rona wanted yeah. to come in and Ben wanted to come in and bring a couple of members and then some more witnesses. Yeah. You were in danger of losing me there, I'm afraid, <laughs> Professor Bowen. I just wanted to pick up you know, on one point you mentioned about how it doesn't really matter what regime we choose to use because um, there's very little difference and stuff, but what would you say to the things we've heard about no reciprocity, that, you know, it's all very one-sided and, you know, we can do that, but they don't have to necessarily agree, so what, what would you say? Yeah, I, 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 it's a good point. I, I didn't get to that. You're right, thank you. On reciprocity... Um, I wouldn't continue to unilaterally apply a lease pendants rule that the other side are not applying. I don't see any advantage in that. So if we have these conflicts of <coughs> jurisdiction in divorce cases, I would like to see us move back to forum non-convenience and make our own decision uh, and, and encourage um, encourage in the, in the international sphere, it'll take a long time, I'm not pretending it's going to be sorted out quickly, but I do think there is room to revisit the issue of uh, divorce in the, in the international sphere and try to get a better regime on conflicts of jurisdiction in the international sphere. That would be the ideal solution. But on a, on a unilateral basis, I think we should um, accept that there is quite strong evidence. I can refer you to cases uh, where, as I said earlier, people are exploiting the lease pendants rule because the provision on divorce in different systems in Europe is markedly different. I mean, even within the UK, it's a problem. I, I, I don't know. I'd be interested the practitioners tell me. There's a big incentive, if you can, to go to England if you're a, a woman rather than go to Scotland. And um, because, you know, the, the English financial provision tends to be more generous to women than to, to wives than to any uh, other European regime. So there is a, a well-documented tendency for people to exploit the race to the court and to use the fairly generous jurisdiction rules that exist in relation to divorce to enable, in the one case, women to, to go to England predominantly and men to go or escape to France or Italy or some other European country. Now, that is a, a real problem. It was identified in the Commission's expert group. One solution would have been to create a transfer provision, <coughs> which we have for child cases, where you can transfer the case from one court to another. Our expert group, um, I better be careful what I say, there were certainly a number of people in the expert group who favoured a transfer provision. The Commission in the end did not introduce any changes on divorce in the Brussels 2A, and I'll tell you why, for, for political reasons. Because they were frightened about certain Eastern European countries raising the whole question of same-sex relationships. So, even though there's a dynamic approach in the EU, that dynamic approach in family law is tricky because it requires unanimity, and therefore, to get any development in the EU, you need all 27, not Denmark are out, all 27 states, if, if the UK were opting in, to agree. Uh, so it's not an easy matter, the dynamism of the EU in this area, because it's a unanimity driven, which is exactly the same as the Hague Conference, a consensus-based system. Direct your question to you, Paul, uh, uh, Professor Bowman, but it would be quite good. Lucia, could you come in? I notice in your paper you, you mentioned mutuality and reciprocity. Is there a difference? You mentioned, sorry, what was your mutuality? question? Mutuality. Mutuality. Uh, no, I, no. I, I think I mainly mentioned reciprocity. Reciprocity. Well, well maybe someone levels. can explain the difference. The so two okay. terms are used somewhere. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, Mr Johnson's question. I think you'd asked um, how do we deal with divorce cases involving a Scottish person and another country out with the EU. Um, so that's something that I, I deal with quite a lot. Um, uh, the answer is that they're quite difficult and they're, they're quite problematic. Um, and there's a variety of ways you can try and sort things out. So you can hope that everybody's going to be sensible and agree. Um, and just negotiate a deal and not argue about which court should be dealing with it. Um, it. It's problematic in relation to some, if you have a link to a Middle Eastern country, say the husband is living in Dubai or 
Abu Dhabi or someplace like that, that they try to use some very quick system to get to a divorce where the wife doesn't have an opportunity to participate and get something through very quickly without financial provision for her, perhaps similar to the Islamic regimes. Um, in that case, you're left with trying to race to get to a decree of divorce here and you have a, a competing race about who can really get to the, the end goal quick, quickest, not who can start proceedings in court first, but who can actually get to the point of having a divorce and financial orders, if that makes sense. Mm. Jurisdictions which are, are more similar to us? I mean, yeah, for example, sure. in comparison to Norway or, or maybe the United States, are, what, yeah. what are the issues? Because that would be probably a more comparable Yeah, comparison. absolutely. Um, so in, in those kind of cases, so you have somebody in America, um, you might end up having an argument about forum non conveniens, which is the most convenient forum, which is, the, which is the place best place to hear the case, looking at where the assets are, where the witnesses are, where everybody is, where, where the parties have the most links. Um, so we can run that argument in the Scottish court, and the Scottish court then says, well, yes, we agree we're best place to deal with it, or no, we're not. But one of the difficulties with that is that, say, a court in Alabama, um, doesn't, isn't bound to really follow that. They may say, well, no, actually, you may think you're best place to deal with it, but we don't agree. We're going to keep ploughing on and run the divorce here, and then you <coughs> end up with these parallel proceedings, which is expensive and, and difficult. I mean, proximity hmm. must also exacerbate that risk. So, I mean, thinking about Ireland, which would probably be one yeah. of the jurisdictions that this would come up most, it might be quite difficult to determine, actually, where are people living? Where are those assets? Because actually people are living between two places, potentially. Is that...? Um, yeah, I mean, Ireland currently, we're, we're on the Liz Penden system to first pass the post, but if it went back to, to forum non convenience, if you had people with quite equal links split between countries, um, then, yeah, it becomes a, a judgment call. Um, I've also had cases where, frankly, it's just become a stalemate mm -hmm. because nobody can afford to run these kind of jurisdiction arguments, very interesting to lawyers, not very interesting to the spouses, um, and it, it just kind of sits there until somebody eventually gives in. Um, so there isn't, there isn't a great effective way of looking at that. How big a problem would that be if we were operating it within the European Union? Um, as you say, the countries are closer. Um, so you might argue it would be bigger. Um, I, I do wonder, actually, if Scots tend to emigrate other places rather than within the EU. So I, I'm, I'm not certain. I'd be quite interested to know how big a problem in terms of numbers of cases it would be. There would certainly be more cases clogging up courts, um, making very interesting work for lawyers, but not so much for, for families going through it. Um, I wanted to come back as well on a point that Professor Bowman raised about England and Scotland. So I'm dual qualified in Scots and English law. Um, I deal with cases that go through the English courts as well as through the Scottish courts. And yes, I, I, there's a lot of cases where husbands would quite like to be dealing with things in Scotland and wives would quite like to be dealing with things in England. Occasionally the other way around, um, but that's the, the stereotype. Um, the EU rules don't operate between England and Scotland um, comprehensively through the regulations. So the regulation, Brussels 2A, that um, deals with where you can divorce, that doesn't operate between England and Scotland, and instead there's an internal UK law. It's the place you last lived together that, that determines it. So that is a, a definite fixed rule which works quite clearly and quite well. Uh, the maintenance regulation, due to the way that that's been implemented between Scotland and England, uh, and an internal UK matter, that does operate between Scotland and England, and that actually causes some problems. Um, and there's some cases at the moment where divorce and division of assets are being dealt with in one court, and spousal maintenance are being dealt with in court south of the border. And that, that makes very little sense to me, but that's, that's something which we can fix internally. And I, I know this isn't really the, the purpose of the committee, but the flaws and discrepancies between how things work between England and Scotland are a real day-to-day -day bugbear in my job. It, it just, it, it's not well thought through how we implement the EU law between our respective countries and, and how that kind of flows. Um, I'm going to bring in two members now. Uh, ben, if you could bring your questions together, that would be good. Ben, then John. 
I'll, I'll seek to try and bring the, the theoretical and the practical together in, in my question as well. But I'd yes. like to turn my questions particularly to Professor Crothers and to Janice Scott QC um, just uh, on these points. Uh, it's been stated by Juliet Harris that as the withdrawal bill is drafted at present, there will be uh, disadvantages for, for uh, individuals with, with a family dispute. Um, going through the, the, the Scottish uh, courts. I wondered if there are any other disadvantages that either of you, you see from a, a theoretical and, and a practical perspective. Also, I, I thought it was, it was really interesting to, to listen to Professor Beaumont's points around the, the, the Hague Conventions. And the, uh, I, I just, what, what interests me is how, is there clarity as to whether the Hague Conventions can guarantee protection? So, uh, and, and I don't mean to quote you selectively, uh, Professor, but you, you stated that it, you know, it, it should be okay with a number of areas and that there would be a gap with regard to divorce. So I just wondered if, if, if it could be clarified whether the Hague Conventions can uh, guarantee protection uh, for Scots on exit day. And uh, just lastly, on the point of reciprocity, uh, it's my understanding that there are a number of changes uh, to family law from an, a, an EU level expected to uh, commence a, a number of weeks or months after exit day. And I just wondered uh, what challenges they, they present in terms of uh, divergence. Because we're nearing the end, um, about 11.15, we'll be aiming to, to bring the, the debate to a conclusion. Uh, thank you, Kavina. It's just a very brief point, and it's about two um, terms that we hear quite often in the committee, and that is access to justice and legal certainty. So maybe looking at the present situation, is it the panel's view that there is access to justice at the moment because there is legal certainty, or is that not the case? Thank you. Your little point just now, too, just a small one. I'll try and make it little, but obviously there's been quite a lot raised during the meeting that even if I can't get an answer to the questions, yeah. I think it's just important okay. to ask them anyway. Um, I, because, like I say, a lot of the points that I was going to ask have been covered. Uh, it was just about the domestic law that we have here in Scotland, of, uh, especially in relation to family law, how much of that is based on EU regulation or directive and what impact will that have when we leave. Obviously, as well as part of the the negotiations that are taking place are taking place at a, a UK level. We have a separate legal system in Scotland. Um, if an, an agreement is reached uh, in terms of the UK as a whole, how, what impact can you see that having in terms of, well, of Scots law and in terms of development of law in the future? I mean, um, I was really interested to hear about all the input you've had, Professor Beaumont, in terms of a lot of these directives. It seems like the UK does play quite an important role in terms of the direction of law and how it's formulated now and moving into the future. How can we have an impact on that? And in terms of the withdrawal bill. Um, obviously, we've heard today that there's going to be gaps in relation to that. How confident are you that some of the issues that you've raised are being looked at? Are you able to feed into that process? And is there, I suppose, anything that we can do at this level in terms of trying to influence some of that too in specific relation to, to Scottish law here? I enjoy all the points that have been made. We start with the first one that Ben raised, um, practical, theoretical um, disadvantages of Brexit in this area. I think mm. what I would <coughs> urge on this committee is to um, look at the profile of family law because it's rather a long way down the list when one looks at trade negotiations and so on. And this is really important for our citizens within Scotland and within the UK. Uh, so can we raise the profile of family law, please? The, other, the next thing to say is that what we're looking at here is essentially about procedure. It's about where you litigate and what happens at the end of the litigation. Uh, we don't have any challenge to the integrity of Scots law as it's administered in Scottish courts in the middle. But family law, as the committee will be aware, is a very fast-moving field. We are having rapid development in what we view as a family um, in the shape of, of, of modern families. Um, and we have an issue as to how responsive um, our procedures are to that. And if one thinks in terms of the Hague and the Hague Conference, um, and Professor Bernard has spoken very eloquently about that, what we have there is a, a group of people who sit down um, 
who, on an international basis, formulate a treaty to which member states can sign up. Uh, and they either sign up or they don't. And so some treaties are much more successful than others because some are well signed up to and others have very few signatories. Uh, and these are very contentious areas. What we have within Europe is a much more hands-on position where there are a fewer states. And admittedly, it's very hard for the 27 states to um, formulate a position on, on some of these issues. But we do actually, we have actually got to a point where there is greater legal certainty. And therefore, as Lucia was explaining, uh, less distress because you can actually tell people what the situation is. And I think one of the things that's been left out from the academic perspective is the number of times I can sit down with a person and say, this is what will happen. Don't waste your money. And so you don't see those sorts of negotiations and advice in the international research on the cases that actually launch forth. Um, so these things have a big effect um, actually behind the scenes. And as regards the recasting, what we've got at the moment is um, a, essentially a third development of the way that this particular regulation dealing with procedure and enforcement is going. And as Juliette has explained very eloquently, uh, that has taken on board a lot of the issues arising for the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which would be difficult now to go back into in The Hague um, and uh, to work on that. Uh, so there was a really bright point there, and we don't know where we will stand with that recasting, because we don't know when it'll come into force, we don't know how it's going to be dealt with in terms of a withdrawal bill, we don't know if we're going to be ossified in the, the current regulation or whether we'll be able to take on board the developments that Juliet was talking about. Um, I don't know if that picks up some of the answers. <laughs> Anyone else on the access to justice and legal certainty point of view that they want to, Professor Carlos? In response to, to Mr McPherson's question, I, I think from the UK citizen point of view, what is the impact of the withdrawal bill as drafted? Well, a, a subject we've already mentioned, but just to emphasise it again, there will be a loss of reciprocity on the existing solution because the UK will apply a lopsided version of the Brussels 2 Beast Regulation on Parental Responsibility and on the Maintenance Regulation. We will continue to honour on current drafting our existing obligations, but the other member states will not because they cannot, in terms of the wording of those regulations, uh, be reciprocal in their application. So that, that will be a disadvantage to UK citizens. Um, the second disadvantage potentially is that on the basis of the withdrawal bill, we would take a snapshot of those regulations as they stand on Brexit Day. And those regulations, EU law is not something that is fixed in tablets of stone. It will change from time to time. And so we, we will have a version of it as it stands in March 2019, while all the other jurisdictions develop in line with the case law and such other uh, regulations as they might decide to, to, to recast. So, it, the lopsided nature of it will give a very imbalanced set of rights to UK citizens, in contrast to what Professor Bowman has said, but in line with the House of Commons uh, Justice Committee report and the House of Lords EU Committee report, I would very much favour that the, the UK government tries to negotiate with EU27 some agreement, not just on Brussels 2 beasts. I think it is, as Professor Bowman has said, completely naive to imagine that the EU would enter into a bespoke agreement on one regulation. But we have a whole suite of EU regulations in this area which have given us a very sophisticated set of rules for cross-border problems for families, but also for consumers, employees and businesses. And looking in the round at the whole suite of those regulations, it would be possible, uh, in line with what the, the House of Lords and House of uh, Commons committees have favoured to try to negotiate some sort of bilateral solution whereby we retain all the great benefits of speed uh, and more limited costs that the EU regulations have brought. And I would support that as the, the current negotiating position. Uh, would, would there be a guarantee on the Hague Conventions uh, available to Scots on exit day if there was a hard exit? <laughs> There's no guarantee in terms of the operation of the Hague Conventions. There's no single court of overarching interpretative jurisdiction in the way that we have the Court of Justice of the EU um, with um, the, the European regulations. So no guarantee can be given, but all the courts of contracting states could be trusted 
to implement and operate the conventions as they, the Hague Conventions as they have been doing to this date, but I wouldn't give a guarantee on it. Uh, Lucia? Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on um, two points. Um, the first was Mr Finney's question, um, is the, there greater access to justice at the moment because there is certainty? Um, I think, as I tried to point out earlier, where you have a very discretionary system about fairness, it's very easy to, to laud that and see how wonderful it is. But if it means that clients coming through my door can't afford to litigate, then there's little point in having this. I, I see this because I deal with English cases, which are much more discretionary, and the Scottish cases where the domestic law is much more certain. And I sometimes have English cases where I think somebody has a wonderful case if they can afford £10,000 to take it to a final hearing, but they can't. So that, you know, the Scottish system would actually serve them better because it is more certain. So that's kind of just a, a comparison of that. Um, if you then extend that out and say, well, would the first pass the post rules, um, do they give greater access to justice because they are more clear, because everybody knows where they stand, even if it's perhaps not the fairest system on a case-by-case -case basis? Yeah, I, th I think it arguably is. Um, having said that, I don't like the first past the post system. I don't think it's fair. But it might be the, wor the best of a bad set of options. Um, Julie, did you want to add something? Um, I just kind of briefly wanted to um, recap on the fact that all of these conversations are around children and young people's experiences. We're talking about children being taken to another country, children being separated from their parents, um, children going through really traumatic um, points in their lives. And I think no matter what happens, whether we're talking about Hague, whether we're talking about Brussels, then a really important thing for the Justice Committee to look at, um, for the negotiations of the UK government to address, is where is the child in this discussion? Um, how can we make sure that whatever procedures are in place, the children's views are heard, that they're taken into account, and their best interests are central to proceedings? Um, because we know that that produces the best outcomes for children and young people. We know that that's the best thing for your families, for your constituents. Um, and so please, I just urge the committee, um, I'd agree with Janice, raise the profile of family law within these Brexit discussions, but raise the profile of children and young people because their voices really aren't being heard and they're essential in family law processes. Okay, and um, any final words? Professor Cromer, briefly, if you could. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, I was asked earlier, and I didn't answer, about the dynamic nature of the Hague. I, I can say that um, the, the Hague will not be constantly revising its conventions. That's not the way it operates. That's not the way international law tends to operate. So you can say that, and I accept that one of the advantages of the EU system, if we were still in the EU, is you can constantly revise. But you can't do bespoke deals with the EU on a constant revision basis. So let's be honest, you're either in the EU and then you can do all these things and be a full player. If, if we're going to have Brexit, there are implications and you can't mimic the EU from outside. That's the, the reality. And as some people are trying to mimic from outside, it, in the long run, that will not work. And that's why in the long run, transitional arrangements to one side, we have to get used to the idea, I think, in family law areas, that we will not be operating an EU-based system. The rational thing is to operate an international system and try and make that international system work well. And I'm involved in The Hague at the moment as a chair of an expert group, trying to get a radically new idea on family agreements to promote family agreements, which isn't very good within the <coughs> EU system or the international system. And there's a, an opportunity uh, to try to get a new convention in the future which will encourage family agreements, which are the real way to protect child's rights, not to fight, not to have disputes, but to actually resolve as sophisticated adults who've had a, their own relationship broken down, but for the sake of the children to actually sort things out in a proper way and then have a system whereby those agreements will be recognised and enforced across the world, which we don't have at the moment. We have no system of promoting agreements, either within the EU or externally. It's true. Um, that's the reality. And we need to try and improve it. And the one forum that's looking at it at the moment is The Hague, not the EU.
Are we content to leave it there? We've, the, the clock has beaten us. One thing is, is absolutely crystal clear. If, if anyone thought family law wouldn't be contentious, then we now know that most certainly isn't the case. And I do thank all the witnesses for your, um, your evidence today, which is invaluable to the committee. And we will use that to see how we move forward. So I now uh, suspend to uh, allow for a change of witnesses in the five-minute comfort break.
Agenda item three is a roundtable evidence session on Brexit and civil, commercial and consumer law. The purpose of the roundtable is to explore issues around civil, commercial and consumer law in the context of the EU and the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union. And I welcome all of today's witnesses to this roundtable session and start as we did with the previous roundtable session by asking you all to introduce yourselves. I'm Margaret Mitchell, I'm the convener of the committee. I'm Gail Scott, I'm one of the clerks to the committee. Gillian Baxendown, I'm also a clerk. <laughs> Philton McGregor, MSP for Co Bridge and Crisis. Uh, I'm Jason Freeman, I'm a legal director at the Competition and Markets Authority, dealing mainly with consumer law. Good morning, Ben McPherson, member of the Scottish Parliament for Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. Uh, Frank Johnson, a partner with Denkins. John Finney, MSP, Highlands and Islands. Uh, Graeme Payton, uh, representing the Society of Chief Officers of Trade and Standards in Scotland. Uh, Liam MacArthur, MSP for Orkney. James Muir, QC from the Faculty of Advocates. Peter Seller, Advocate with the um, Faculty of Advocates. Liam Kerr, MSP for the North East Scotland region. Maurice Corrie, MSP West Scotland. Paul Bowman, Professor of EU and Private International Law at the University of Aberdeen. Mary Goujon, I'm an MSP for Angus North and Mairds. Jenny and Carruthers, <coughs> Professor of Private Law, University of Glasgow. Daniel Johnson, MSP for Edinburgh Southern. Rona Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Bears Den and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Okay, can I thank you all for your written submissions. I noticed someone was trying to press their, um, their, their speak uh, button for, for the microphone. You don't need to do that. As soon as um, I call your name, uh, then your microphone will automatically call, come in. Just as in the last session, we were looking for good cross um, kind of dialogue so that the, the witnesses can, if you like, um, add to challenge or uh, question whatever um, someone else has said, then that would be really what we're aiming for, a flow and uh, a flexibility and not a rigid kind of evidence session, although obviously everything that is said is, is in the public uh, domain. But in order to, to make sure it doesn't deteriorate into shambles, I'm sure it wouldn't, then if everything could go through the chair, then that would be very helpful. So can I perhaps, um, again, as we said in the family law um, session, then EU law and the whole Brexit issue has the potential to, to be very technical, to be very complicated. So our aim is to distill it into um, a conversation which is reasonably understood where the issues are understood and where we can get really good evidence to move forward. So if we could perhaps begin, and um, if I could begin by asking uh, the witnesses if they could explain in their opinion the size of the issue in terms of civil, commercial and consumer law and Brexit and what they consider is the likely impact for consumers and businesses in Scotland. And who would like to start with that? Professor Bowman this time and then um, Professor Crothers. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I can't begin to to give you an answer on the scale of the problem, not being a practitioner, that would be a little bit um, presumptuous <laughs> of me. Um, but I can try and outline what the, what the legal issues are, uh, at least from the private international perspective, and others can add in some of the legal issues which are not so directly private international of folks from the Competition and uh, Markets Authority, for example. Um, in private international law, the, the issues are as Janine said to a previous session, basically always three points. Which court will hear a case, jurisdiction? Which law will govern the dispute, applicable law? And on what basis do you recognize and enforce foreign judgments? So in private international law is really quite um, simple in that sense that there are these three issues. In the civil and commercial field in Europe, we have harmonized rules on all these issues and we have one instrument that deals with jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement of judgments, that's the Brussels 1A regulation as it now is. Um, and we have two instruments in the field that deal with applicable law, the Rome 1 regulation on contract and the Rome 2 regulation on non-contractual obligations. The 
The EU regime has developed uh, over many years, starting with um, the, the Brussels Convention in 1968, so there's a long history in this field. And in the applicable law side, it started with the Rome Convention in 1980. When the Treaty of Amsterdam came in in 1997, there was a movement across from making treaties between the EU states, conventions, to having EU regulations. And that's why now this area is governed by EU regulations. It's governed by Brussels 1A regulation, Rome 1 regulation, Rome 2 regulation. Um, the system for jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement of judgments is very simple because of the progress that's been made over the years in, in the Brussels 1A context. And we have uh, quite clear rules for <coughs> applicable law in Rome 1 and Rome 2. What will the effect of Brexit be? Well, that depends, of course, on the nature of the, of the deal that, that might be done. Let's assume that uh, after any transitional period, there is no special deal between the EU and, the, and the, the UK in this area. Let's assume that. What would happen? Well, what would happen is you would fall back on um, potentially a broader European regime that applies to uh, some EFTA countries called the Lugano Convention. And at the moment, the UK is a party to the Lugano Convention as a member state of the EU. So the Lugano Convention applies to Norway, Switzerland and Iceland, as well as all the EU states. If we want to remain a party to the Lugano Convention, which is current UK, UK government policy in public domain, um, then we would need to get the consent of all the other contracting states. And the, the potentially the easiest route for doing that would be if we were a member of EFTA, the European Free Trade Association. Um, if we're in Lugano, the changes in relation to Brussels 1A are, are not enormous because Lugano is based on the Brussels 1 regulation from 2001, whereas we now have in Europe a modified version of that from the Brussels 1A regulation in 2012. So you're basically going back to the law as it was in 2001. On most matters, that really isn't a big deal. The one big deal, and I negotiated uh, the Brussels 1 regulation and the Brussels 1A regulation for the Scottish and UK governments in, in the Council. So the big change that we won, and we were pleased to win in Brussels 1A, was um, to deal with dealing with choice of court agreements. So if the parties have agreed, let's say, to resolve their dispute in Edinburgh, if we apply the new Brussels 1A regime, if one of those parties reneges on that deal and goes to Italy to try to litigate there in the hope of drawing out the whole process and getting a settlement, because Italian courts are slow, um, under the new system of Brussels 1A, the Scottish court can go ahead and hear the case, and the Italian court actually has to stop hearing the case until the Scottish court has decided, because the Scottish court was chosen. <coughs> under the Lugano Convention, um, indeed the system is the, is the traditional first-come, first-served system in Europe, whereby if the Italian court receives first, it decides whether the choice of court agreement was valid or not, and it can take years and you have a slow process. So there is that important difference between the Lugano Convention and the Brussels 1A regime. And it would certainly um, be a disadvantage being in the Lugano regime rather than Brussels 1A on that point. The other area of applicable law isn't a problem because Rome 1 and Rome 2 are applied by EU states um, unilaterally, they're applied universally. So the, the rules in Rome 1 and Rome 2 that identify which law applies to a dispute will be applied in the future by EU states in the same way whether we're a member of, uh, of, of the European Union or not. And we can unilaterally continue to apply Rome 1 and Rome 2, which is the current plan. So there would be no change. So I think there is no, uh, no conceivable problem on applicable law. The problems are on um, jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement of judgments. To complete the picture, 
If we can't stay in the Lugano system, which is possible because there are voices, Professor Hess, for example, from Germany is raising his voice saying, we don't want the UK in Lugano, because if you're not a full member of the EU, you won't really comply with Court of Justice decisions and therefore we don't want you. <clears throat> I was at the Lugano experts meeting. I didn't hear that kind of voice being raised there at the official meeting. I was there um, invited by the Swiss government as an expert, as a, as a professor, to be at that meeting. Um, I would say, in all honesty, that, that there's more of a, amongst the states uh, that were there, more of an openness to the UK staying in the Lugano system. And I hope that would be the case if, if um, the UK decides, as it currently does want to, to try to be in Lugano. I'll have to work out how to, how to make that happen. Anyway, if for some reason we're not in Lugano, <laughs> what do we have? Well, we have only one bit of an international regime at the moment. That's the Hague Choice of Court Agreements Convention, which means that on, when there is a, an agreement between the parties as to jurisdiction, that will be respected vis-a-vis uh, -vis the EU because the EU is a party to the Hague Choice of Court Convention. And if we leave, we'll become a party. I mean, that's government policy. And therefore, it would apply between the UK and the EU. But that leaves all the cases where the parties haven't got a choice of court agreement. And at the moment, we have no rules, international rules, for recognition and enforcement of our judgments in the rest of Europe in that scenario. However, I am currently an independent expert for the EU negotiating in The Hague a new convention on recognition and enforcement of judgments. It's in a fairly advanced stage. One more special commission and then a diplomatic session. So it should be finished next year. It is currently EU policy to support that convention. Therefore, I have every reason to believe that in due course, the EU will ratify that convention. I hope the UK would, in its new out of EU form, ratify the convention. And then you would have between the UK and the EU a perfectly workable recognition and enforcement regime to deal with making sure that judgments given in Scotland are recognised in Germany or German judgments are recognised in Scotland. But it's not going to be in place immediately following Brexit. It will take a few years. So there will be, if, if we have a hard Brexit, a gap in the recognition and enforcement of commercial judgments that are not based on choice of court agreements. I will ask you what you do in your spare time, but <laughs> <laughs> Professor <laughs> Crothers. On the current wording of the uh, withdrawal bill, the effect um, of repeal of the European Communities Act 1972 will be that the European private international law regulations in this area cease to have effect in the UK. Of the instruments that Professor Bowman has uh, referred to, the most significant is the Brussels One recast regulation <coughs> on jurisdiction and the recognition and enforcement of uh, judgments in civil and commercial matters. Looking at this practically from the point of view of the UK uh, business, consumer, uh, employee, the Brussels framework provides uh, great advantages to such parties because the, the regime, the Brussels regime, which was designed to support the internal market, um, it constitutes a set of agreed rules of jurisdiction in civil and commercial matters. And flowing from that, the principle that a judgment on a civil and commercial matter issued by a court in one member state will be recognized and enforced in all other member states with uh, certain uh, exceptions, but the, the, the principle is basically one of reciprocal recognition and enforcement. So that portability of a judgment, if a Scottish consumer uh, employee or, or business gets a judgment in one member state court, that judgment is then portable and can be enforced across the EU, and that is a great advantage. When Brexit happens, even if the UK adopts the wording of the recast <laughs> regulation into domestic law, we cannot bring about the reciprocity that we currently enjoy. So even if a Scottish court 
is prepared to recognise a judgment issued by a French court, we cannot ensure that a French court will reciprocate vis-a-vis -vis the Scottish judgment. And the consequences of that uh, for businesses, consumers, people who currently operate <coughs> under the terms of the recast regulation will be prejudicial. So uh, the current scheme of the withdrawal bill will not be effective to ensure reciprocity for, uh, for businesses and consumers, and that is a, a flaw of the current proposal as far as the private international law is concerned. That is focusing on the recast Brussels regulation. One could point to a raft of other regulations uh, dealing with more procedural <coughs> matters. Also instruments such as the insolvency regulation, where the same reciprocity cannot be brought about simply by the, um, the actings of the UK government alone. And so uh, if there is any hope of preserving the benefits of the, the European regulations that would have to be done on a bilateral basis with EU 27. It's not something that the withdrawal bill can achieve on its own. Ben? <coughs> uh, taking that point from the, 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 the withdrawal bill as, as drafted and the potential for commercial and, and consumer uncertainty, I wanted to touch on uh, Graham Payton's point in his evidence that at the point of exit, the UK's participation in the Rome Convention may cease and these protections will no longer be available to UK consumers. This could have a major impact on consumer confidence to buy goods and services from Europe. I would be really interested to, to hear more on, on that point and the, the impact for consumers uh, here, in, here in Scotland and, and across the rest of the UK. And, and, and Mr Johnson as well, I wondered from a, a commercial uh, contract drafting position and, and from a, as, as a representative of a, of a commercial law firm, what are the impact for what is, are the impacts at the moment for solicitors trying to agree transactions for clients and uh, what, how is uncertainty affecting the, the, the economy in that way and the, and the transactional activity and, and the, 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 the considerations that are having to be made in current contract drafting in order to uh, try and mitigate the the vast uncertainty that the withdrawal bill is, is currently creating at the moment. If, if I could just touch on that, that point very briefly. My, as I made clear when I re accepted this invitation, my interest is primarily consumer law within the domestic context of the UK. Um, I am, however, aware that certainly more in the commercial enterprises have been and are looking at how they can safeguard and achieve a degree of certainty in terms of of co entering into contracts. That is certainly not the case in relation to the consumer uh, position, who is obviously less able to, to actually take positive steps to secure their interest. And the point that Professor Carruthers made about, and indeed uh, Professor Bowman made, about the, the ability to enforce a judgment abroad is critical from the consumer interest, obviously. I think it was Lord Stair that said that a right without a remedy is like a bee without a sting. And a right without an, an effective, accessible, and cost-effective remedy is really um, uh, not sufficient for, uh, for, uh, to safeguard the consumer interest. And can you, can you please do? Thank you. Um, I made that point on uh, the jurisdiction of consumer contracts purely because, um, as a trade and standards professional, we advise consumers on their rights and remedies under, under laws that currently stands. Um, my understanding of uh, the jurisdiction of consumer contracts under, under Rome conventions, although Jason's probably a, a bit better, up, uh, has a, a good deal more knowledge than I do, is that um, under current arrangements, the, a consumer uh, has got the right to raise an action against a, a European business in their own court. They also uh, keep their domestic rights under consumer contracts as opposed to those offered in the foreign jurisdiction. If that changes, then the rights of consumers, depending on where they buy goods from, will differ. Um, and that presents a, a, a danger of divergent rights for consumers as, as we leave the EU. It also, it also gives us an issue of trying to advise consumers going forward, depending on the jurisdiction from which they bought products. Do you want to, to add anything? Yes, there's a, there's a couple of points I think it'd be useful to make at, at this stage. The, the first is just to take a step back and look at the whole uh, corpus of consumer law and to um, emphasise the, the widespread harmonisation that's taken place on consumer law at EU level uh, 
Um, so in, in terms of the substance of the law which exists at the moment uh, across the UK and of course across the EU, the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive in particular um, carried out a huge amount of, of, of harmonisation of our laws. Um, other instruments like the Consumer Rights Directive have, have harmonised um, cross-border distance contracts as well as um, domestic distance contracts and of course uh, laid down various other rules. And there's other uh, more sector-specific harmonised um, laws which exist. So all of those laws will, uh, in principle, be uh, transferred, as I understand it, into UK law at the point of exit. Um, however, the UK government would be able to um, diverge from those. Uh, and then maybe after Brexit, uh, the uh, reality of uh, divergence between UK law as it is at the, at the date of exit and, of course, um, EU law as it uh, develops. And there are a number of legislative proposals in train at the moment in the EU, which, uh, or, or at least policy proposals, which may become legislative and some legislative proposals, which uh, are likely to change EU law. Um, that will mean there's a choice for the UK as to whether, they, uh, wh whether we um, implement those changes, which we would be uh, able to do as a sovereign uh, country, um, or uh, whether we don't implement those changes and, and then divergence would, would, um, would occur. Is that going to be important? Well, in the context of purely domestic transactions, clearly it wouldn't, um, wouldn't make a huge amount of difference. So our law would remain the same. There'd be less cost to business in uh, effecting those changes. Um, however, businesses dealing into the EU would then deal, have to deal with um, different uh, systems. Um, where there are those differences, and a consumer is dealing uh, with a business based outside the UK in the EU, so a business like um, a, a big online uh, platform like Amazon or eBay, which is domiciled in Luxembourg, uh, then there'll be a question of well, which law applies to that contract and how would you go about enforcing your rights um, in the event that you had a problem? Um, uh, you know, would you be applying UK law and be able to bring the, 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 your case in the UK courts or, or would you not? So I, I feel others have, have addressed that point already. The other point which I think is worth talking about is uh, cross-border public enforcement. Um, the rules which exist at the moment in respect of um, Rome and Brussels uh, regulations will also, we understand it, apply to um, public enforcement. And that's on the basis that our enforcement actions brought under Part 8 of the Enterprise Act would be a civil and commercial matter, uh, and therefore they would be covered by the rules which apply to give the UK courts jurisdiction where there are UK consumers affected, and um, generally speaking, to apply UK law, except in the context of a contract where a choice of law clause has been made, when, as Graham's already mentioned, the consumer can't be deprived of uh, their mandatory um, protections under UK law, under the, the system. And that was found by the CJU in a case called VFK and Amazon, um, about looking at the position for Austrian consumers and the, the, the facts would apply the same uh, to UK consumers. So in that context, if we or trading standards wish to bring proceedings against a business based out elsewhere in the EEA, um, subject to funny little differences between Lugano and the other um, laws, generally speaking, we would expect to be able to bring those proceedings in the UK, serving out of our jurisdiction um, without a problem and being able to enforce our judgment, um, generally speaking, without a problem. Uh, having said that, um, in the CMA, we do think about, well, what might be the case to, if we can, uh, can, can, we, can we give effect to UK rulings without needing to rely on international conventions or regulations? The reason that we do that is because often we may wish to bring proceedings against a company who is not um, in the EU at all. So we do think about... Uh, the possibility to serve out with the court's permission, which we believe we, generally speaking, can do, where there are UK consumers and we believe that UK courts would be prepared to accept jurisdiction um, where there are UK consumers in a foreign business. We don't believe that the, the UK courts would decline jurisdiction. Uh, and given the realities of modern international trade, there are likely to be UK-based intermediaries uh, who can be prevailed upon to disrupt a business's activities, particularly if we have obtained a court order against that business, which um, would mean that we wouldn't necessarily have to serve any or enforce any judgments overseas. Um, for example, being able to take down a website or um, uh, ask for blocking of a website or disruption of payment processes um, just under the usual um, enforcement of a, 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 an injunctive-type remedy. 
provisions which exist in um, English, uh, UK civil procedure uh, rules, and I, 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 I believe would also be uh, pertain in Scottish procedure rules as well. So we have looked at the position in the absence of um, there being international conventions, and the position for public enforcement we think is not uh, as bleak as it might otherwise be, because we think that generally speaking, we would be able to extend reach. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions on all of that, because I appreciate there's quite a lot of material there. Absolutely. Um, b before I bring in um, Lee McArthur, yes, James Sloan from the Faculty of Arts. Yes, I, I just wanted to, um, to introduce one or two points. I think the, the, the issue of uh, confidence is key here, because the great majority of consumers are, uh, I'm afraid, uh, unaware of what their rights are um, un under most of these um, provisions. Um, Businesses are perhaps more aware of what their obligations are to consumers. But um, it appears to me, and, and, and I did look at the, the sort of statistics in Scotland about the number of cases uh, about enforcement of judgments and so on coming into the, uh, to the Scots jurisdiction, and they barely figure uh, at all, not even a little sort of pimple in the, uh, in the bar charts that you get published uh, annually. Um, and therefore, uh, it seems to me that the international um, uh, perspective of the CMA and the ability to cooperate um, with other regulatory agencies around the EU is going to be key um, because you're going to have to have some element of consumer confidence. And the concern is that if the transitory provisions aren't uh, um, clear and effective, then by the time we're definitely out of the EU, um, uh, you know, that the, the past may have been sold. Uh, and of course, this isn't just an issue for Scots consumers, it's an issue for Scots businesses, because if I'm a, uh, if I'm a, um, a consumer in Germany, I'm thinking of flying to, to Scotland, am I going to use a, 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 a UK-based airline, or am I going to prefer to use Lufthansa or, or a German one, where I can be, be clear that it's somebody that I understand and I'll be able to. So all of these issues of confidence, I think, are key, and that's why the, the way in which these negotiations are handled in the next, in the next 12 months uh, and, and the outcome of, the, of both the withdrawal agreement and, and looking forward seems to me to be key. Uh, Lee MacArthur, before I bring Professor Bowman in again. It follows on a little bit from that, but it was more in response to what Professor Carruthers was saying earlier. I think um, previously we've heard um, there being more of an incentive and a, and a, a mutual benefit to be gained of, uh, on, on, on both sides from continued collaboration in the, uh, in the sphere of, of criminal justice. It's less clear to me whether something similar exists in relation to what we're discussing uh, today. I mean, I think what, what James Muir's just talked about maybe suggests that, that perhaps there is, but I'd be interested to know whether um, the, the, the view of, of uh, the experts here is that there is more of a, there's more of an incentive to find some uh, form of uh, agreement post Brexit, Brexit, whether through Lugano or whatever it may be, um, than, than uh, perhaps we're, we're led to believe by some of, uh, of the evidence that we've received. Who would like to address that one? Professor Covers and then Professor. I suppose one of the considerations is what makes a particular jurisdiction attractive for people to litigate in or to agree to litigate in, in future, even if they don't actually bring that to litigation. And um, the British Institute of International and Comparative Law in London has, has done quite a bit of research on this, what makes places attractive to litigate in. And the possibility of having secured a judgment in one jurisdiction and then being able to take that to another country and, and to, to enforce that judgment abroad is something that makes uh, a court, a forum, particularly attractive. It, it's one consideration, there are, are many other considerations. And I suppose from a UK perspective, what makes Scotland or uh, a higher number of cases, what makes England an attractive forum in which to litigate is the fact that you can then take that judgment and in principle, in theory at least, enforce it elsewhere. And from the, the legal services sector perspective, there is a, a sense that if you take away the ability uh, through this European scheme to be able to enforce a judgment across the EU, then that might be one consideration that uh, makes Scotland or England less attractive uh, in, in which to litigate. And possibly the practitioners are, are, are probably better placed to be saying whether that impact is being seen. Uh, is it having any significant effect in, in Scotland at present when people are looking at drafting commercial contracts? Uh, is that a concern with clients? In theory, it, it, it's a, con a consideration, but whether in practice it's so, um, that's for others to, to comment on. Thank you. Um, dealing first with the consumer point, I think it's important 
to clarify that the Rome Convention does not apply. Let, let's be clear about that. The Rome Convention doesn't apply to any contract after 2009. And it only applies to applicable law. It's not got anything to do with jurisdiction. So, first of all, the regime at the moment, as Jason has outlined, is that you have consumer contracts are governed by the Brussels 1A regulation in terms of jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement, and they're governed by the Rome 1 regulation in terms of applicable law. And the combination is that a consumer can indeed sue in his own habitual residence, can sue the, um, the business, and he can normally apply his own law unless he agreed to a contract which gave a choice of law clause to the business's law, in which case it's a combination then of the foreign law, let's say Luxembourg law if it's Amazon, and Scots law in relation to the mandatory aspects of Scots law, which is an extremely complicated system, but that is the system we have. Now, post-Brexit, what would the system be? Unilaterally, we would continue to apply Brussels 1A and Rome 1. The consumer would still be able to sue Amazon in Scotland. The consumer would be applying Scots law in combination with Luxembourg law, if that was the law chosen in the agreement, in the same way as they currently do. Nothing would change. The only thing that would change is whether that judgment would be capable of being recognised and enforced in Luxembourg. And as Jason has pointed out, in practice, consumers don't engage in these litigation. The fact is it's too expensive. It just doesn't happen. So private litigation for consumers is a non-issue. Let's be blunt about it. It's, only Jason can, can, can help consumers. It has to be public litigation, and that will continue. And as he rightly points out, public litigators are big enough and strong enough to be able to enforce an English or a Scottish judgment against a European company without needing to take the judgment to Luxembourg. So again, in practical terms, I don't see any diminution, likely serious diminution in the rights of consumers because of Brexit. If we're talking about commercial transactions between two companies, then let's be honest, there isn't that much business coming, international business coming to Edinburgh because of choice of court clauses. Let's, let's be honest, it goes to London. In, in, on a vast scale, and it's been going to London on a vast scale long before we were members of the European Union, because London is the global capital of commercial litigation, has been pre-joining the European Union, and in my view will continue to be post-leaving the European Union. We are envied by our partners in Europe, they'd like a share of the business. The business goes to London, either for arbitration or for choice of court if it's big commercial transactions. And there's no European centre can attract that business because none of them at the moment offer English language litigation and that's the key. Dublin might be able to, but not on the same scale. Yeah. From what you've described, it would almost be a, a, an inbuilt incentive then for the other 27 um, member states to expose as big a difference between um, the UK and, uh, and the EU approach to, to this as possible in order to claw back some of that commercial advantage. That's that what Professor Hess would like. Yes, that's what I said. It, it's, it's, there's an incentive for hardball to be played by Europe to stop us getting our judgments recognised and enforced there, which means keeping us out of Lugano, not giving us a bespoke deal. That is true. That's the hardball approach. Mm -hmm. Not everyone plays hardball. There are plenty of people out there who would like to be cooperative with us and would, would continue to I want us to be partners in Lugano. I don't see, frankly, much, again, reason for a bespoke deal. Why? Because you would have to accept the binding jurisdiction of the Court of Justice to have a bespoke deal, and that, in my view, would be a mistake. Now, I say that again as a committed European, because you should only accept the binding jurisdiction of the Court of Justice if you're a full member of the EU and you have a judge on the court and you influence its development. It makes no sense, in my view, to be in that position from outside the EU. We should, the Lugano is the compromise where you take due account of the Court of Justice's rulings, like Norway has to at the moment and Switzerland has to, but they're not bound by the decisions of the Court of Justice and they don't always follow them. Mm. And that is the reality. Therefore, I would say there's a good case in this current UK government position for commercial business to stay in Lugano so that business confidence will continue to use English choice of court clauses. But my own view is that that is 
not a big deal because in relation to choice of court, which is where <coughs> businesses are actually choosing London, we've got the Hague Convention, which is just as good as Lugano, in fact, marginally better than Lugano, not quite as good as Brussels 1A. But Brussels 1A, frankly, for me, is not an option unless we stay in the EU. So, you know, the real options in the real world are Lugano or The Hague. And in that, if that's your choice and you want to protect London market, and it's not Edinburgh, this is not Scottish, but this is London. You want to protect London market for commercial court. I would argue The Hague is a better solution than, than Lugano because all the EU par partners are party to The Hague. So they have to recognise and enforce a judgment coming from London based on a choice of court clause. And they have to give way to London, whereas under Lugano, as I explained earlier, because of the Gasser decision, they don't have to give way to London. So actually, there is no real <coughs> point of view of party autonomy, no big value in staying in the, in the Lugano system. So I'm an advocate of, from this point of view, um, if you like a hard Brexit, <laughs> stay out of the civil ju judicial cooperation mechanism, fly in the international scheme, because we're big enough to play in that scheme in justice context. Not Scotland, but, but London. That's, that's my honest assessment. Peter, and then Jason. Um, um, you mentioned that there was not likely to be much of a diminution in consumer rights, which goes back to the average consumer, the individual person, uh, going to a court here in Scotland and taking a case. Um, that's as much a question of access to justice in terms of how much it costs to take that. I know there was a point made in the other session about that as well. Um, and just a small point there, we do pay a lot um, to the courts for our day in court in Scotland. Um, you pay nothing when you're in the European courts, and I realise those would be in different circumstances, but there are no court fees for, uh, for your day there. Um, I agree entirely, though, uh, with regard to the issue of the, the, the choice of courts. This is really a London uh, thing. Scotland sometimes... Uh, gets or attracts business, uh, but it is predominantly an English, in, in my view anyway, an English-driven service, which we also know that the UK government um, is rather keen to, uh, to champion. And I say that because the official paper from the UK government mentioned UK law and UK jurisdiction and UK courts, which of course, as a sensitive Scots lawyer, you realise it's not quite right, and the focus there is clearly on London courts and English law. Um, but standing back from what an average consumer or private individual would be doing, I think we have to bring back in the, the public law remedies or the public enforcement powers. Um, at the EU level, the private consumer can rely upon a myriad uh, and complex matrix of different types of powers and enforcement, whether it is through the European Commission or through cooperation via national authorities, etc. And those are almost a, a fail-safe um, mechanism to protect the consumer. Either they go to court, unlikely as that is, or they rely upon what has been decided from a regulatory and a public point of view, and they can ca call upon um, authorities to come in on their side. So. Oh, I raise a question, what are we losing uh, when we Brexit? Um, what reciprocity uh, will we be losing? Will we be able to continue to piggyback on the, the, the RAPEX uh, recall uh, systems? Will we also be able to continue to part uh, participating in the Solvit uh, system? Will we have access to all the information uh, on biocidal products, on cosmetics, on chemicals, uh, on toys, etc.? What will happen after that, because that is as much a part of consumer protection uh, as asserting your own individual rights in a court. Could you elaborate on the solvent and the other thing you mentioned? <laughs> you, the, the, you go the, so quickly. No, of course, we're, the, we're not versed. Of course, the, there are a few directives and regulations which have been adopted at the, uh, at the EU harmonised level, which put in place systems of cooperation amongst all the member states so that if there is um, a faulty good, which is made by, for instance, an Italian producer but is sold uh, throughout the European Union, there will be, it's a weekly um, uh, update, there's a weekly bulletin, and every day there is, uh, and, and as, as an example, you can go on um, and they will show you exactly what product 
has got a problem with it. So I checked yesterday, apart from anything else, and there was one of these funny eyebrows, children's toy. Uh, it's flammable, apparently, so there's a recall. So what happens is that there will be a recall, a statutory recall process put in place, so that all the retailers, etc., will have to take the measures to recall um, the, uh, the offending item. Um, the producers, obviously, or the importers, because if it is an American producer, then it will be its importer that will be on the hook for this. Uh, they have to take measures, etc. So this is that's an example. That's R A P E X system. That's an example of a system which is a harmonised uh, system, which is there to protect uh, the consumer from dodgy, faulty, defective products. Example is always good. Yeah. Helpful to uh, go into a little bit more detail actually on the provisions for cross border uh, enforcement collaboration which exists uh, and indeed the, the opportunities which exist at the moment for us to be able to enforce uh, UK rights, uh, UK law overseas. Um, the European system devised a piece of legislation called the Injunctions Directive um, a number of years ago now, uh, which has been updated um, in about 2009. Um, it originally came into force in about 2000. Uh, which permitted, it created the Part 8 enforcement regime, Part 8 of the Enterprise Act, um, and it permitted enforcers such as the CMA and other um, uh, public enforcers to have standing in courts elsewhere in the European economic area um, so that we could bring cases to enforce rights on a collective level o overseas. Uh, it's important not to overemphasize the importance of that. The only uh, enforcer who has brought a cross-border um, case in that way was the Office of Fair Trading twice in Belgium and in the Netherlands, and those were difficult and expensive cases to bring. So whereas it's a, a, a useful uh, fallback position, it's, it, it, it's, not, um, it's not ideal. And indeed, the European legislator accepted this and, and uh, devised the Consumer Protection Cooperation Regulation, uh, which is also in the process of being revised at the moment, but is um, the law which... Uh, lays down several features which have been implemented into UK law, a minimum set of investigation powers uh, and the requirement to collaborate with uh, other enforcers who, you know, in, in the event that we have a request for investigative assistance or we wish to make a request for investigative assistance, then there will be um, a, a mutual obligation to co collaborate and to uh, carry out that sort of investigation. So, for example, if I've got a business based in um, Slovakia, for example, which is sending um, mass-marketed mailings to the UK and we want to know what's going on in their office, we could request the Slovak Consumer Protection Authority to go and carry out an on-site inspection and to find out what's going on there. Uh, and then we could, if we decided to, then request the Slovak Consumer Protection Authority to bring enforcement proceedings against that body to stop them from uh, sending those misleading mailings into the UK, for example. So it's a, a reasonably effective um, bilateral cross-border enforcement mechanism, and we would be uh, hopeful that either that system will remain um, available to the UK after Brexit, or um, a similar arrangement will be put in place on a, uh, a bilateral basis between the UK and the EU, because we don't think it's in anybody's interest, really, for there to be an enforcement gap um, whereby British businesses would be able to mislead, say, uh, French consumers, and there wouldn't be the mechanisms for cross-border enforcement. That's not in anyone's interest in the EU, and it's also not in our interest for that to, to take place it's, uh, uh, when it's coming the other way. So we think that it should be negotiable um, to uh, replicate those provisions going forwards. Um, the other thing which the CPC network has been work, uh, d developing recently is a way of working where we're tackling a common problem together. So this would be a, a big business or a big issue which is going on across the EU and we need to coordinate on a European level. Uh, there have been four such uh, joint actions which have taken place so far. Um, there was a joint action on um, uh, children's apps and games, a joint action on car rental, um, a joint action on social media and a kind of slightly more light touch joint action on airline terms and conditions, which was not coordinated at the same level. Um, however, those are useful ways of tackling things on a regional level, and likewise, we think that, that it, it should be reasonable um, to negotiate continued access to that sort of coll collaboration going forward, so that big problems which are affecting consumers all across the European area uh, can continue to be dealt with in those, uh, 
um, quite effective ways. Thank you. Explain the difference between directive and regulation. Does one trump the other? And will that have any impact whether the legislation we're looking at is a regulation or a directive in the, the Brexit context? Well, I think the, the difference is, is can be quite technical and a re regulation is generally directly applicable and just applies across the European Union and, and tends not to require specific implementing acts unless there's some mechanism. Like in the case of the CPC regulation, we had to implement the powers provisions because it just said member states have to ensure that these powers exist but it didn't give the enforcers the powers um, a directive is binding as to the effect that it seeks to achieve but there's usually a, a need for uh, direct um, uh, direct enforce uh, direct in, uh, implementation of the directive by the U the uk uh, so it's, it's it's a slightly That's different nice. legal framework um, but in, in practical terms Personally, I don't think there's a huge amount of difference between, say, the Unfair Commercial Practice Directive. Um, had that been a regulation, you know, like the geo-blocking regulation, it would probably have been drafted in exactly the same way. So there's not a huge amount of difference. Thank you for clarifying that. Daniel. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to remind uh, members of my register of interest that I uh, am a director of a company with retail interests in the West End of Edinburgh. Um, and the reason I stated that is because uh, we've talked a lot about consumers, we've talked a lot about big business and just really I think following on from James Muir comment about the the German uh, traveler using a, a UK website to book his flights the the, the, the UK's uh, online uh, retail is much better developed than, than the rest of the the EU's we've got the last time I checked about double the volume of or, or proportion of, of retail sales going online as compared to the rest of Europe what are the implications for for online retail um, and, and, and sort of small and medium-sized businesses wanting to sell into Europe as a result of these sorts of changes, given that right now, if you comply with UK regulations, you know you can just sell away. Um, I'm just wondering what, what perspectives people might have on, on, on that impact. Like that one? Frank? Have I got the right name? Yeah. Sorry, you should have been Graham. No, <laughs> I can't see your, 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 your badge no. here. Yeah. It's an interesting point because increasingly sales are affected um, both with Europe and abroad for consumers based in the UK uh, on an online basis and regulating that sector is challenging particularly if we're not within a larger geographic and economic group so um, there are challenges there and a lot of the and this point does relate to the point that Jason made that where there are risks um, emanating from abroad and where there are emerging risks which are emanating from abroad is really very helpful if those can be dealt with at source through organisations like the Consumer Protection Cooperation Network um, where um, national enforcement bodies can speak to each other, share information, share intelligence and address those sources of consumer harm at source in the country from which they emanate. And now, Graham. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, um, I would, uh, I'll answer that. If I could also elaborate on, on a comment that, that Peter made with regards to RAPEX. RAPEX is the, is the system we use as a, as a, as a representative of the, of the enforcement and uh, market surveillance um, authorities in Scotland, the 31 local authorities, enforcement market surveillance authorities. RAPEX is one of the, the systems we use to, to identify consumer products which have got a problem. There are also, there's also, um, another system called ICACS, which allows us to see other market surveillance activities by other market surveillance authorities across Europe. That informs what we do. There's also another system called RASIF, which is similar to RAPEX, but it's for food and animal feed. Again, as with regards to animal feed, we get, we get alerts that there may be a problem and we can take action to, um, to uh, remove them from the marketplace. Um, there, are other, there are other, if I might, if, I'm, if I'll crave your indulgence, there are other um, uh, there are other um, just not that paper. There are other um, bodies that we um, that we currently rely upon for consumer protection reg uh, and, and trading standards, uh, which underpins this kind of regulation. In addition to RAPEX and things like that, um, called uh, Wellmec, which is the Western European um, uh, legal metrology body, which sets uh, the standards for legal metrology. There's also SEN and SENELEC, which are the, the, the European standardisation bodies for 
well, standardisation and for electrotechnical standardisation. These all underpin, these, these create standards which underpin our, our product safety law. Now, if product safety law and uh, legal metrology law, now if there's a diverge, if we, if we leave the EU, will we, get, will we still participate in these bodies which set this, this, the technical standards which underpin our legislation and our ability to enforce that legislation? And this comes back to uh, Daniel's point that if if we cannot participate in these standard bodies and these standards cease to be across a European standard across a, a, peer, or a, or a standard which is applicable across, across the UK and only applicable to the EU uh, to the UK um, you've got this you've got two positions you've got one where um, uh, <coughs> our ability to um, where we where there's a divergence of standards across EU and UK. So you effectively you've got two different standards for the same piece of legislation, which adds a burden on business as far as I can see, in that in order to trade in Europe you might have a different standard. It also means that that um, if when we leave the UK, if when we leave the EU, the the customs union bit which allows you to import goods into the EU, the first the first point at which the goods come into the EU is where it gets checked. Once it gets through that point, it can go anywhere in the EU. If we're not in that anymore, then that means that uh, any goods that come into the, the EU will possibly get redirected to the, to the UK port for that, that, that assessment for compliance with uh, British law before it can come into the, the country and be sold. Now, currently, um, th that would mean that, that small, but small business enterprises would would become, could become an importer or an exporter, where in fact they're, they're not so defined at the moment. And that, that becomes a, and that's a, that could be an additional burden which, which uh, small business enterprises, uh, small business don't appreciate yet. I, I, do, I did actually make that point in one of my paragraphs, uh, paragraph 20. Uh, perhaps it's more um, uh, lucidly pointed out in there. Okay, we can certainly delivery. refer to that when we're looking back at the report. Um, Peter? Just, I would just um, endorse what Graham's been saying. It, does, it will depend upon the product that you're producing in the West End and sending to, to France to, to the consumer. At the moment, it can do so. You can do so relatively seamlessly. If it's a regulated product, and a lot of the products that we make are now highly regulated, I mentioned toys and cosmetics uh, as examples. Um, if it is regulated, then when we are outside the European Union, we will be a third country exporter. So we come into the import-export issues and, and the difference in statutes is going to be quite significant because it means that you're no longer a distributor throughout the European Union. You are an exporter into the European Union. And you'll have to change your relationship, going back to another question about commercial contracts, you'll have to change your relationship with your importer, the person in Rotterdam or the person in Antwerp who is receiving it and declaring it for customs purposes becomes the importer. Their job is no longer simply just a distributor as well, a non word distributor. They have a whole load of different obligations depending on what the law is. And if I was to go into the world that I inhabit a bit too often, it's biocidal products regulation, that's mosquito repellents, it's dettol, it's anything that kills things when you're not applying it to a field for agricultural purposes, roughly speaking. But if you're looking at mosquito repellent and you're, you're sending that, selling that in the EU, you are highly regulated. You have to go through all sorts of hoops and hurdles. And if you don't do that, then you're committing a crime. So in a post-Brexit world, your importer will have to adopt all those obligations and be able to have the paperwork to show to whichever authority, uh, if it's in Belgium, then to the Belgian authorities, that they have complied with the BPR, which means having pretty well uh, done a lot of discussions with people in Helsinki because that's where the European Chemicals Agency is and has a certain role in looking after biosolid products, etc. So there's a whole different dynamic in terms of your legal responsibilities your legal obligations and who you are to discharge them to beyond the, or in addition to, declaration for customs and having to pay a tariff. Right, I wonder if we could move on then, having looked at some of the, the problems, some of the legislation, Rona. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Yeah, we've heard about the, the current situation and also the consequences of Brexit. I'm just wondering, um, is, there a, is there a plan? Is there a, are there a suite of options on how we will deal with these matters after Brexit? Um, I mean, 
are the industry, you know, how far advanced are, are plans to sort of say, well, you know, is there is there a, an option? What what would the best option be for dealing with the changes that are going to take place? What are the various options? <laughs> are there any? <laughs> might be an impossible certainly question. some in your papers. Uh -huh. um, yes, Frank. Professor, Professor Bowman. Make a point which is more of a regulatory point rather than a strictly legal one that when we leave um, the EU in certain sectors, and for example, the financial services sector, which is um, authorised, uh, regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, it would seem to me unlikely that the FCA uh, would ignore emerging risks to consumers which are being identified by consumer authorities in Europe. It would seem to me unlikely also that they will ignore. Um, the interpretations applied to certain matters by the European Court in the way they go about implementing their obligations in terms of protecting consumers within the UK. So it's more of a, more of a kind of regulatory point, but it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an important one because particularly where there are, is a financial ombudsman service, for example, which is free of charge mm -hmm. for use to the consumer, um, and where the um, FCE is a very proactive uh, regulator, that they will be very keen to identify risks where consumers within the UK are being harmed, even though perhaps they're seeing the first signs of those um, harm, that harm uh, emerging in the, the EU. Okay, Professor Bowman. Yeah, I, I, we're, we're almost um, straying into trade law, which is not my area of expertise, but I make a very general point, which I, I hope isn't <coughs> incorrect. It's very hard for people to plan on the future trading arrangements with the EU until we have the final deal that the UK hopes to agree on a trade deal, because it's precisely those kinds of issues which are encompassed in the trade deal. So whether you will have complete regulatory alignment in any particular sector, which would mean there is no change, if, uh, if I understand correctly, and other areas we will probably begin some kind of regu potential regulatory divergence. Therefore, for people trying to plan, I don't know how you plan until the trade deal is finished. And we've no idea what will be in the trade deal at the end of the day. And I think that's life. So there are certain things that you can anticipate there may be problems, but you won't know the nature of those problems until the trade deal is, is finalised. That's different from civil justice issues. So you've got, a, you've got an EU law trade issue there and, and the impact of leaving the, the customs union in the single market and how far we diverge from the customs union in the single market in the trade deal. So the closer we are to the customs union single market, the less these trade problems will arise, the more we diverge, there will, there will, there will arise more. But on the other hand, and you state the obvious, if you then have the freedom to create different trading arrangements with the rest of the world, if, and it's a big if, you have enough of those new trading arrangements with the rest of the world, the cost-benefit analysis might be a positive, not a negative. We don't know that yet. <coughs> That's a long-term view rather than a short-term view. The short term, there's obviously going to be a hit. That's, that's clear. In the long term, you could actually um, shift your balance of trade. After all, pay attention to the fact we all know it that in goods trade, we do very badly with the rest of the EU. It's only in services that we do well. So, um, in pure trade terms, our involvement in the EU um, isn't a big success in balance of payments terms, even though we have a single market. So for the individual traders, it's easy. But is it necessarily working for UK PLC? That's a, that's a bigger question. And that's a question we also have to be concerned about. So there, there's that side of it, that if UK PLC actually might do better in the international market rather than the European market, then in the long run, switching our attention to the international market rather than Europe it might be a good thing. I'm no expert, I'm not an economist, I'm just pointing out yeah. that, that that's a very big picture rather than the technical legal aspects. And I don't think we can address the technical legal aspects of trade issues until we know what the trade deal will be. On the civil justice side, which is the issue about jurisdiction, applicable law, recognition, enforcement of judgments, I've said already there will be... Um, <coughs> a gap for commercial to commercial companies in being able to inf enforce their judgments against other EU um, companies. How big an issue that is, is the big question because actually recognition enforcement is not needed very often. Usually uh, you get your judgment and the actual other side just pays up. It is very rare to have to do cross-border enforcement. So although I would like to see an improved cross-border enforcement regime, and in fact I'm negotiating one in The Hague, which I think would do the job from a recognition enforcement point of view in the future, 
if we don't have a bespoke uh, European deal or we don't stay in Lugano. Um, I, I'm not sure, trying to be objective, that for business-to-business -business relationships, the lack of a bespoke EU civil justice deal, i.e. harmonised rules on jurisdiction and recognition enforcement, is a huge issue from a business point of view. Okay, Rona, and then I'll bring in Jane. <coughs> I just wanted to sort of expand on that a wee bit and ask maybe some of our, our other uh, panellists on um, if there is a no deal is, is the, the, the outcome, what, um, what effect do you think that would have on Scottish businesses and, and consumers? Um, what, what actually would, what would, do we just carry on and, and, and maybe go international trading as Professor Bowman has been suggesting or what would be the outcome of that? Before we, we, we ask more generally, um, James, you wanted to pick up on the, oh, the point yes. that Professor Yes, Bowman and I think perhaps it, it plays back to, 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 to your point as well. Um, uh, the answer is that people have looked at these from different models. Um, people have analysed consumer law. What happens if we adopt the uh, EEA, uh, stay, uh, stay in, uh, in, in that or, or negotiate our, ourselves in that? What happens if we're falling back on a, a WTO, World Trade Organisation model? Um, and of course, we know that the aim is, is for some bespoke model. And of course, it's difficult to, to look at the consequences of a bespoke model until, as, as Professor Beaumont says, uh, you can actually read it. Um, uh, but I think there has been a concern um, expressed widely over the last year or so that consumer protection has not figured sufficiently uh, in the UK government's papers on this, um, uh, that it wasn't, it wasn't one of the kind of main principles that was laid down early on. Um, and, and therefore, I think there is a, there is a, a need for people to, uh, to articulate consumer protection particularly. And I say that because, um, and I've said it before, the irony of all of this is that the point at which the British consumer will best understand what being in the EU means is at the point that we're leaving. And uh, it's at that point that people are going to turn around and say, well, hang on, have I lost that? Remember those roaming charges that I didn't have to pay? Are they back on now? Or or you know, the, the denied boarding um, issues, or the package travel issues, or we've heard it geo-blocking, the, 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 the right to have access to digital uh, uh, services as you, as you travel around the, the EU. Um, and I think that's the key point, that, that you don't want the consumer to wake up on a particular point, start reading stories in the press about how they've been let down yes, by what, the process. What can you do about it? You know, what can be done now about that and I take your point entirely but well the, the answer is to, to, to bring it up the agenda and you've heard mm -hmm. you've heard from from Janet Scott earlier the, the same on, on family, on family law. Law. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 these are issues that that will affect real people because we're not going to leave the global marketplace we're still going to be buying things on the internet uh, sourcing things uh, traveling into Europe uh, and people are going to we've got a huge tourism industry people yeah. are going to be traveling here so it seems to me that um, the more, and, and, and also just to make the point that much of the, um, much of the EU law on this uh, is not simply minimum standards, which leave states to put in higher standards, but is harmonization. So it's actually the same throughout the European Union. Uh, and, and therefore, the closer that you can remain um, with, what's, with what the law is elsewhere, it seems to me, the, the better. The difficulty with that, of course, is that um, if you don't accept the interpretative judgments of the Court of Justice, um, then there is bound to be an element of divergence. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a whole question about how you, how you direct the courts as to, as to the yeah, manner in which they should yeah. treat mm -hmm. um, uh, Court of Justice jurisprudence for the future. Thank okay. you. As, a, as an enforcer, as, uh, as I previously said, the... the a lot of the laws that we enforce are directives or from regulation. Um, if there's simply a lift and shift, in, then maybe these won't immediately impact. We'll still be able to, I'll still be able to, to do legal metrology work. I'll still be able to enforce the Law of Weights and Measures Act. I'll still be able to consume protection regulations. They'll all still be there. Um, it's when the divergences begin to, begin to happen that, that will cause problems for, for uh, enforcement bodies. Um, Certainly, the, uh, the regulations that brought in roaming charges, the regulations that brought in uh, uh, compensation for delayed, cancelled, or refused boarding, are all from EU regulations. They will have to, they will have to be brought into, into uh, British law. Um, the 
so that the effect immediately from a, a, an enforcement point of view it won't be it won't be that stark uh, especially given the um, the, the additional uh, transition period that appears to be negotiated at the moment but ultimately if our standards of our technical standards start to diverge from Europe that was going to cause that's going to cause issues um, it's going to cause issues for consumers it's going to cause issues for business uh, additional burdens on running two different standards producing two different goods for for, for different markets um, and then the question becomes will European businesses bother manufacturing to the, to the British standard, which will result in a, in a drop in consumer choice? Uh, probably would result, if they did manufacture, a, a stark increase in prices to consumers, because the opportunity, the, uh, the cost of business will go up and it will get passed on. So there are, there are, a, great many, uh, there are a great many issues further down the line that you can see that if we, if we go through, you know, if, we're, if we're not part of the single market, the customs union, if we're not part of those, if we are part of those then, then great, that makes my job very much easier. Um, but if we're not, then it introduces a whole, a whole new maelstrom of potential outcomes, um, which I understand from my colleagues in Bayes, um, they're spending hours trying to work out what those possibly could be. Um, and until they, until they get some sort of steer from, from those above or it, the, the, uh, the outcomes, the aims of the the, uh, the, the British government become apparent to them, they won't be able to predict exactly which one it's going to be or which, which of them are going to be, which means that, well, to an extent, this is, this is to a larger extent guesswork. Okay. Ben, very briefly, and then I'll bring in Peter, and any concluding comments? Thank you, Veena. It's just related to, to what Mr Payton's just said, which was around, uh, do you, you stated quite clearly there that uh, maintenance of membership of the single market and the customs union would, would, would provide that added continuity that, that would be beneficial for consumers and businesses. I just wondered if others wanted to comment on, on that point because uh, of that being a, a political area of discussion at the moment. Peter, you did want to make a comment. I'm not sure if it was in that point. <laughs> Maybe it's related. I, I wanted to um, pick up on a specific comment or a specific question about whether or what we can do from a, a consumer protection. So looking at it from us around the table as individuals, what can we do to try and maintain the level of protection that we have uh, become accustomed to and that we can look forward to, to continuing to improve, frankly, at the European level? Um, I personally haven't seen much... Uh, by way of the type of lobbying that you would hope to hope to see. I've, I've kept quite a close eye on the exiting the EU committee as an example. You have lots of witnesses who come before um, uh, that committee from the CBI, for instance, and from uh, other industry uh, organisations. I haven't seen one from which, for instance. Uh, I'm not saying that, that's, um, that they're not behind the scenes making their point, but I haven't seen it personally that uh, uh, widely broadcast, not least because it's difficult, because you're representing a very generic, uh, you're representing the entire population effectively, and it's not a subtle, nuanced uh, position that you can, you can lobby. Um, in terms of the cliff edge, if we go without a, a trade deal, without a bespoke deal, um, what we fall back to are the, the, the WTO terms of trade. Within the WTO, WTO terms of trade, forgetting tariffs, etc., um, you have got agreements such as the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, the uh, sanitary, fan, uh, Phytosanitary and Sanitary Products Agreement. They all deal with any barriers that are put up by WTO members to the import uh, or the selling of products. Um, so you can imagine uh, a beef hormone, for instance, if there's an issue with beef hormone and we, we ban it here, well, that would be a WTO matter. But the critical thing here is that the consumer has no say in that process whatsoever. So whenever we hear about WTO disputes, you'll hear it, the words are Boeing and Airbus or it's bananas, which is Chiquita or whatever it is. This is not an individual who's taking the case. It, it is left very much at the governmental level. So in terms of a fallback, falling off that cliff edge, immediately what I say is that the consumer is right down at the back of the, the queue of concerns. And Graham, briefly again, then um, James. I would direct the, the panel to um, a, a report that the House of Lords produced a couple of months back on the protecting consumers at Brexit, which was, uh, which was, was perhaps what the Commons is missing. I would also point out that the Chartered Trade and Standards Institute has convened what is called a think tank to consider how um, all these various uh, 
the various changes will, will affect um, trade and standards law, which most of which I detail here, but it would include uh, animal health and welfare. Uh, hopefully that report will be produced certainly within the next six to nine months, and it may direct thoughts of the panel. And James. Just two, two short points. First, on the single market, um, I mean, it's interesting that um, in the last several years, much of the EU's work on, on consumer protection has really had as its basis um, the expansion of the single market um, uh, rather than um, perhaps coming at it from the consumer rights end. And indeed, there are some who are critical of, of the EU for, 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 um, for putting the, the business um, side ahead of, of individual consumer rights. Um, but the other point I'd make is really that it may come down also to resources in this country because if we are having to set up offices our, ourselves, and I mean, we, we, I think there was a, an announcement just a, a day or so ago about a new office of product safety, for example, um, but it will require resources to be put in um, to ensure that, for example, regulatory agencies are able to cooperate internationally, as has been the case to date. Um, and I'm afraid, as with other sectors of the economy, you can't underestimate the, the need to put the resources in, particularly during the period of transition when confidence may go through a bumpy period. So I would, I would stress that. Um. That really concludes our round table. Can I thank you all very much? I've set out um, some of the issues very clearly. What isn't clear, of course, is what trade deal we're, we're going to eventually end up with. So I understand a lot of this is speculation that you, you have um, come, come with, looking at the various scenarios and trying to, to address these. So I thank you all very much for your attendance today. It's been very worthwhile in trying to put this in perspective. And um, the committee will look at this report and see where we go from there. Um, I, if I could now suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave. Four is uh, Brexit and family law witness expenses and um, it's to ask men, members if they are content to delegate responsibility to me to arrange for the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body to pay on request witness expenses on the Brexit and family law session. Are we agreed? We are all agreed. Thank you. Agenda item number five, Brexit, civil, uh, commercial, consumer law, witness expenses. And again, um, to ask members if you're content to delegate responsibility to me to arrange for the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body to pay on request uh, witnesses expenses for this uh, round table session. Are you all agreed? Yeah, all are agreed. Thank you very much for that. We now move into private session. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 6th of February, when we have an evidence session on remand and a round table evidence session on alternative dispute resolution. <laughs>